mainland China market both down down by 2.4 percent though on the Hang Seng and this reflecting ongoing disappointment it seems about a lack of sort of shock and awe stimulus coming through uh, from Chinese authorities although we keep in mind the Politburo meeting at the end of the month US 10-year yield as we head into a big week for central banks we're keeping in mind with 3.84 percent where we'll be by the end of the week and this is the uh, Brent crude price at around $80 a barrel 80.68 down half a percent let's have a look at the futures picture and this tells us an interesting negative story really for stocks but also a story specifically around Spanish politics. So the DAX futures down by four tenths of one percent, FTSE futures down four tenths of a percent. So broadly we do see negativity across the European stocks picture and we had the Nasdaq a little weaker during Friday's session, maybe as partly a driver in particular in Germany. IBEX 35 futures down by 1.6 percent and this has a lot to do with the inconclusive nature of the Spanish election that we saw taking place just yesterday. Now the Spanish IBEX usually one of those markets that opens up pretty quickly. Right now we've got the FTSE 100 down a tenth of a percent. So we do have that expectation that we'll see weakness coming through. And there you go. The Spanish IBEX down by 1.7%. Inconclusive politics, not what investors like. They like, uh, they like decision. They like uh, direction. They don't like indecision. Uh, perhaps also the fact that this inconclusive result means that the left did better than was anticipated, better than investors would have assumed maybe going into the elections on Friday. Although I will point out that our guest on Friday was warning us about the, uh, the, the dangers attached to assuming that this was all in the bag for the right. And certainly it was not. So we wait to see how that one develops. More analysis from Madrid coming up this hour. The pound a little bit stronger. The euro just on the back foot, down a tenth of a percent. Leaves some room for the pound and the euro to gain just a touch this morning. The pound up by two tenths of one percent. And in terms of the really big week for central banks, keeping an eye on the sovereign bond column, you can see uh, we've actually had some movement in Spanish bonds, but uh, it, in fact, pretty flat though. We've had an opening, I should say, for Spanish bonds, but no great movement coming through. So it doesn't appear on the GMM. We do have French and German two year though. We're seeing buying there and we're seeing yields uh, coming down the opposite the case over in the United Kingdom here in the United Kingdom where we see selling of gilts at the two-year with those yields going a little higher let's have a look at the sectors and when we do that, interesting to see where banks are trading because some of that Spanish weakness could find its way into the Spanish banking sector uh, would be something to watch out for. And we do see that the banking sector is down by nine tenths of one percent. That does seem to be one of the weakest sectors here. Uh, there has been tension between the uh, socialist government and the banking sector. There's been taxation much talked about, uh, of course, as well. And so we see uh, uh, some further weakening there. Utilities also down by seven tenths of one percent, uh, also weaker, I should say. So we are seeing a range of sectors in negative territory. Let's dive back into the market thinking this morning. Christine Aquino joins us from the Markets Today blog with thoughts. And we talked a little about the soft landing narrative. I wonder how that stands up to all of the central banking uh, news that we're going to get this week then, Christine, because the market's still watching that soft landing narrative, watching what the central banks have to say, and watching what the earnings stories deliver this week. Absolutely, and uh, And really, that soft landing narrative very much hinges on what we see from the Federal Reserve and other major central banks uh, delivering their decisions this week, particularly the the Fed, right? I think, you know, uh, rate hike very much in the cards at this point in time, at least for this month. But really what investors are going to be looking out for is their future outlook. Are they going to start hinting that they are nearing the end of their cycle? Or is Jay Powell going to insist that the Fed remains data dependent? It's going to be a meeting by meeting decision. Nothing else is decided. It's all really to play for when it comes to the Fed decision this week. Okay, so all to play for when it comes to the Fed. We'll certainly keep that in focus as well as the ECB 
ECB and the BOJ front, so on the central banking front, that's what we're watching. What about the UK specific stories? We've got bank earnings, but we talked about that last hour. So let me go to the other UK stories that you flagged for us today. One of them's around job vacancies. And just like in lots of other parts of the developed world, we're looking for clues from the jobs market that, 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 that we're seeing impact from all of the central bank hiking that's, that's happened to date. Absolutely, Anna. And what we're seeing in the UK now is a continued loosening of the job market, particularly when it comes to vacancies. You know, that's up again. We've seen a number of indicators pointing to more and more vacancies uh, now coming up in the UK jobs market, which is all well and good. But of course, the other side of the labor market story is what's happening with wages, right? And so in theory, less uh, uh, job openings available for workers means that there's less kind of pressure on that wage inflation piece. But we know that that has very very strong momentum and so we'll see you know if that kind of translates into less pressure as well kind of lower um, asking prices in terms of wages but mm. very much uh, uh, good news potentially for the Bank of England given that they have a lot of other issues to contend with okay uh, nice to think about wages as asking prices that's a, a nice way to phrase it from the housing market what about the China uh, stimulus story we've been talking about this for weeks haven't we Christine you know when are we going to see if we're going to see further sort of coordinated big scale stimulus from China, although some voices caution that's not necessarily what debt markets and, and, and the property sector in particular needs over in China. What are, what's the latest on our expectation there? Well, Anna, I think there's still very much, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of disappointment that we haven't seen that really a big concerted effort from the Chinese government. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier as well, I think the next key part of this story is, of course, the Politburo meeting that we're going to see at the end of this month. That's really where we get the latest reading uh, from the group in terms of their growth assessment, whether they think that 5% growth is still achievable. Remember, of course, that we have seen a lot of Wall Street banks downgrading their growth outlook for China to match that 5 percent level that the government is expecting but with a lot of room for downside and so that really is the danger here is that mm. is a Chinese government having to recalibrate their growth expectations and is that a sign that maybe that big concerted stimulus that everyone seems to be waiting for might just be around the corner or will they keep their powder dry for tougher times right yeah certainly the direction of travel the momentum has been towards downgrades hasn't it for the Chinese economy Christine just briefly then on the UK banks because we're going to get earnings from a lot of banks here in Europe this week the focus today maybe on the Spanish banks with certainly a, a lot of negativity attached to that sector. What do we expect from the UK banks in the reports there? Well, Anna, I think there's it, there's consensus that perhaps the profits that they have enjoyed in the first half, quite surprisingly so, um, may have been the best of it, essentially, you know, because I think, as we talked about earlier, there's a lot of focus now on whether banks are really passing on that interest rate benefit that they've enjoyed uh, over the last year and a bit uh, to consumers and whether they are uh, giving them higher savings rates uh, to correspond with those higher rates. And so there's going to be a lot of focus on profiteering and mm. a lot of uh, mentioned probably of greedflation, especially among uh, consumer outlets. And so there's going to be a lot of focus on that. And I'm sure banks in the UK are going to be very much wary of that narrative. OK, so that's where the politics might take us. Christine, thanks very much. Christine Aquino from our Markets Today blog. You can find the blog on the front page of the Bloomberg UK website. So you find uh, the link to it there. Or you can type TLIVGO onto the Bloomberg terminal. That will also take you to the Markets Live blog. Let us check in on the individual stocks that are on the move. Joe Easton has an update. Joe. So these are stocks in focus at the early start of trading. Anna Ryanair getting hit down around 3%. They do warn of a decline in sales in terms of some of their capacity in the quarter ahead. That's after their earnings for the last quarter were actually slightly better than expected. So that is outweighing that. Meanwhile, Philips, the sales forecasts look pretty strong. They did increase their outlook for the full year. But the CEO was talking about the continued weight of that sleep apnea device recall that they're spending around a billion euros trying to settle. Meanwhile, Ocado and Auto Store contrasting pictures. Ocado jumping around 8% in the UK market, but Auto Store dropping. Auto Store will pay Ocado around 200 million pounds in order to settle a patent dispute around some of their robotics technology. So analysts on Auto Store not liking that one today. Then in terms of some of those Spanish movers that you mentioned earlier in the show, so Santander, the biggest bank in Spain, that one down around 2%. But they do have exposure to a lot of other countries, so it's mainly the more domestic banks that are getting hit harder. Caixa Bank down 2%. Also saw BBVA was dipping a bit earlier in the session as well. Meanwhile, Iberdrola, this is, of course, the energy company. There's a lot of uncertainty around energy policy in Spain. 
And with this added uncertainty around the government, there will be questions on how some windfall taxes might progress on that sector. I've also brought up IAG. This is, of course, listed in Madrid as well as in London as well. That's probably a bit of a read across coming through from Ryanair, but also generally the Spanish market declining. So that's the Madrid-listed stock down 1.7% in early trading. Just a few others then. Restaurant Group, we said that one earlier, getting a potential takeover interest from a US hedge fund. This is, of course, the owner of Wagamama and Frank and Benny's here in the UK. Vodafone gaining. They've got some better than expected organic sales growth, partly due to some of their new 5G spending that they've done. Meanwhile, the biggest decliner on the stock 600, Bavarian Nordic. This company does vaccines, and they've just announced that one of their vaccines didn't meet the trial requirements and their latest data, according to the company. Separately, we've got a profit warning from S4 Capital. This is, of course, the company founded by Martin Sorrell after he left WPP. A warning from that one, a weak economic outlook. S4 Capital is the worst performer in London today. OK, yeah, really uh, big moves then for Bavarian Nordic and S4 Capital. Thanks for that, Joe. Joe Easton from our equities team. And as he was talking about S4, I just was minded to check what other advertising groups are doing. WPP, as you might anticipate, weighed down by that news there. So that particular stock down by 2.4%. Publicis is also down, but just uh, over a percent weaker. So thanks to Joe for the update. Let us get a look at what is on the agenda, what's in the diary for this week. Today we will get provisional PMI data for the month of July for the UK, Germany, Germany and for France. Tomorrow, Microsoft will report earnings, rounding off a period in the spotlight for the company as it attempts to acquire the game developer Activision up against a challenge still here in the UK. Then on Wednesday, we will have the Fed's rate decision, of course. Economists surveyed by Bloomberg expect the Fed to hike by 25 basis points. On Thursday, it's the ECB's decision. The central bank is also expected to follow the Fed with a 25 basis point hike. Uh, we will also have results from Mercedes, Volkswagen and Renault on that day. Finally, then on Friday, we'll have the Bank of Japan's latest policy decision. And throughout the week, we'll be watching as several European banks report, including Deutsche Bank, Santander, Barclays and BNP Paribas. Coming up, it is a bumper week for central banks, as that run through the diary has just illustrated. The Fed, the ECB and the BOJ all meeting. We will get views from TD Bank. Pooja Kumra joins us shortly. This is Bloomberg. CEO Mark Rowan. In January, Apollo closed its $11 billion all-stock merger with Athene Holding. It had already owned 35% of the insurer. Here's what Apollo gets out of the deal. Assets under management. Apollo expects them to double to about a trillion dollars by 2026. Much of that projected growth will come from the merger. And those assets are especially attractive to Apollo. Insurance companies typically go after much more modest returns than buyout investors. That will give Apollo more options for investing the cash. Athene is a steady provider of fee income. It has grown into one of the nation's biggest holders of fixed annuities, those retirement savings products favored by risk-adverse customers. The merger will also allow Apollo to simplify its governance. It gave up its dual-class share structure and adopted a one-share, one-vote plan. The hope is that will eventually lead to Apollo's inclusion in the S&P 500. The names that move markets are on Bloomberg. China has seen slower growth than they expected. Many countries do depend on strong Chinese growth to promote growth in their own economies. For the United States, growth is slowed, but our labor market continues to be quite strong. I don't expect a recession. I think we're in a good path. Nobody covers business like Bloomberg, your global business authority. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, trying to open. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg.
market expects another rate hike. They're getting the message loud and clear. The Fed <clears throat> wants to go again. The then what is the big mystery. But will it be the last of the cycle? Is it one and done or more to come? Does the Fed make policy um, based on what they're worried about or what they actually see? Trust Bloomberg for the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis. Twice more is not too high of a bar. The Fed wants all options on the table. Bloomberg surveillance. The Fed decides. Wednesday on Bloomberg. Your global business authority. The question is, if you look forward for the next five to ten years, where is the right inflation target? And I suspect that the right inflation target is much nearer to 3 percent than it is to 2 percent. Now, that may not sound like a big difference, but it actually is a big difference over time. Bloomberg Opinion columnist Mohamed El Arian speaking to Jonathan Ferrer and Tom Keane, talking there about what he sees as sensible for the Fed's inflation target. Now joining us, Pooja Kumra, senior European and UK rate strategist at TD Bank. Very nice to have you in, Pooja. Good morning. Thanks for coming in on a Monday. Let me ask you about the Fed then. Let's start there, shall we? Because the, the Fed, uh, in the middle of the week, looms large on the, on the horizon, on the calendar. Do you think it's July and done for the Fed, or do they want to keep hawkish, keep September options on the table? Thank you. I think we in markets expect a July hike, and I think after that, Fed does not want to commit to anything. We are seeing positive trends, but the economy has not been disinflated yet. So they would like to see more data, which is the July as well as the August inflation report, where we do see the inflation actually coming around the 0.2% level. And I think that's where in September they could actually announce their pause. But I think that's how we are. But they are still not in the state that they want to entertain any ideas of cuts in 2024. And I think that is something that could be disappointing for hmm. markets. Do you think that, so we might not get them tell us what September is going to be just yet. But when we get there, is it likely to be a pause or is it likely to be a skip? Are you suggesting that there, that there won't be any hikes after that or, or is that still a possibility? That's a great question. Uh, so I think they possibly they would still maintain the current dot plot, which says there's one more additional rate hike on the radar. So I think that's where they pause and they just say that, you know, we are looking for one more, but we don't think that the data is going to support another rate hike. Mm, OK, let me go on to the European story and just bring to our audience, uh, Pooja, some data that we've got just breaking across the Bloomberg terminal. The French July manufacturing PMI coming in at 44.5. The forecast was for 46. Uh, the July services PMI falling to 47.4. The forecast was 48.5. So just on, on, on first glance, Pooja, these numbers both are lower than had been forecast. And uh, what we, what's interesting here is we continue to see this divergence around what manufacturing and services are doing at the eurozone level where we've seen a decline in manufacturing and growth in services but here in france we've got both of those below 50 suggesting weakness on both fronts how are you viewing the eurozone economy at this point so the eurozone is actually behave i mean we are seeing when we look at the economy from in growth perspective as well as inflation perspective it's working the way ecb wanted it to work right uh, we are seeing downward pressures across the board. And that's why last week we also heard Hawks saying that they need not hike in September. And that's where we think that communication for ECB will be more tricky because they generally pre-announce their next move. But I think in July they will be more like they are looking at the key data points. And we are seeing slowing across board, as you mentioned. And uh, for ECB, it's also tricky. We have Spain inflation that's at 2%, but Germany is still above 2%. So I think they do need to maintain a balance that there are certain mm. Euro area countries that are at target right now. Right, OK. So yeah, it was interesting to hear those normally hawkish voices being yes. a little more dovish about September. And that does fit with the weakness of the data we're seeing then. So we've been through that, that France uh, manufacturing and services picture, both of those then coming in below estimates and that manufacturing one below 45. Uh, this is having an impact on the euro. It had gained earlier on. It's now lost its gain of the session. It's at 111.21. I was interested to look at some of the, the commentary around the strength of the euro recently, Pooja. If measured on a nominal effective exchange rate, I was reading over the weekend, that's kind of trade weighted, then it looks actually very expensive versus history. Yeah. And I wonder if it, that, that means it's vulnerable. Maybe we're seeing some of that vulnerability today. I think, yes, right now markets are in a vulnerable land. We are in the summer time, so I don't like to read much into how mm. they're moving right now. But I think we are basically, at least in the next three months, we are looking for range-bound moves. We don't think that either Fed or ECB will be a major driver. But I think today's services numbers is basically is another path for ECB because services has started to turn around finally. So far, it was just the manufacturing that was showing weakness, and that's why central banks were ready to turn a blind eye. 
But I think just to uh, talk about services, also one of the key risks I think you also mentioned ahead is do we get a China stimulus? Are we underestimating how China growth will be in the second half of the year? So I think that is something that we will be watching mm. out. And that would have an impact on Europe then? Definitely. How Germany, does that work through? Oh, I think Germany is definitely clo closely dependent on China. And I think if you see Q1, we started with a lot of optimism on German economy just because we thought that you know China is back in boom and China determines European rates. So I think I feel that US is less uh, benched upon on China, but I think in Europe we do actually look for any stimulus and that could be very bearish. Mm. Does that, that plays into the German manufacturing side? Exactly. No. And where does that leave the European services side? Because as you say, the, the, the ECB has been increasingly focused on the services side and on the wages the component of services. Yeah, I think services are going to slowly trigger low and that's where we think that the overall number will remain sub 50. But I think what if we do see some positive signs, I think one of the key things that we will also be watching is the bank lending survey that we get today, uh, this week, which will be key to know how the economy is doing. Europe is a bank-driven economy. So I think when we're looking at services, I think one thing that I will be closely watching is the bank lending survey. Mm. Interesting to think about Spain uh, right now. It's certainly weighing on the stock story, isn't it? The IBEX is down by 1.1%, but not very big movement on, uh, on Spanish bonds. Uh, the, the market's sort of just uh, standing pat right now, just waiting to see how this politics plays out, I suppose. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, it's incredible how resilient peripherals have been to any election risk right now. And it also tells you that, you know, it's very hard for markets to actually move towards right and left. And similarly, we saw this in the UK uh, regional elections last week. Also, it was inconclusive, right? It was bad for conservatives, but it did not really paint a strong picture for Labour. Mm. And we are pretty much there in Spain. Likelihood is for another election, which means we will be in the just choppy price action for now. Okay, choppy price action. I was reading a piece by our colleague uh, Marcus Ashworth on gilts, and he was suggesting we could see volatility there uh, because we're really not entirely sure when the top comes. Hmm. What are you seeing on the gilt market, given the, the threats around the housing market and adjustment there to, yeah. to, to, to higher rate levels? I think when it comes to UK, uh, we still think that the 50 basis points rate hike last time was one and done. We do expect more positive signals, and that will be also in this week's uh, UK services data. We will we are looking for a downward move. Inflation is moving in the right direction, but still elevated versus the other peers. So I think the message will be from BOE that they will do a 25 basis points in August, remain restrictive, but also I think all the hawkish move is over in uh, gilts. We have really been bearishly priced. So from a trading perspective, we are looking for 10-year gilts to be around 4%. Being long, Gills versus bonds as well as treasuries is something that we recommend right now. Okay, we're at 4.239 right now on that 10-year uh, yield on UK gills. Pooja, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us this Monday. Pooja Kumara, Senior European and UK Rate Strategist at TB TD Bank. Coming up on the programme, it is a busy week for European companies, the busiest, in fact, uh, reporting earnings on the stock 600. We discuss what to expect with a focus on luxury and banking uh, giants. That's next. This is Bank. What do you like most about your job? I think the, the people. I mean, ultimately, we're a people business. A lot of what my job is as, as CEO of the company is to you know, give those people sort of motivation to tell them where we're going, to encourage them to come up and do their best work, to encourage them to collaborate. Sometimes you sort of think you're almost a psychologist, you know, as you are a business leader, I think, sometimes. And, and so what's your best piece of advice? I, think I love... Um, pitches. I love being sort of leading from the front, if you like, and spending times with teams. I love to see the work that we're doing. When we pitch for a piece of new business, often when we come together. So I, I guess I try and put myself 
in the seat of the client. Now, what's the client going to think when they see this work? Are they going to be excited? Is it going to turn their brand around? How is it going to resonate with their consumers? So as much as possible, I think probably I'll try and play that role. Studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West. Only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. markets today 23 minutes into your european trading session and negativity in particular over on the spanish market i think the spanish ibex is down by 1.1 percent the stock 600 uh, weaker by a quarter of one percent the FTSE down on par with that the cac a little bit weaker down by four tenths of one percent so european earnings season is well underway with banking and luxury in particular focus this week last week uh, saw richemont report quarterly earnings that included an unexpected decline in u.s revenues so we'll be watching out for numbers from lvmh and from caring for more let's bring in Bloomberg's uh, Alex Pearson, who joins us now in Frankfurt. Alex, very good morning to you. So what are investors going to be looking ahead to this week in terms of these earnings stories? Good morning, Anna. Um, that's right. We have uh, in focus this week uh, luxury stocks. Uh, three big luxury goods makers are reporting this week. And investors will really be looking at sales trends and expectations in China and the United States. Um, these are the two biggest markets for this sector. And recent data out of China suggests that the economic recovery there is waning, that consumer spending is decelerating. And uh, we, as you said, in, uh, with Richemont posted an unexpected decline in the U.S. last week, which has investors concerned that both the U.S. and China might not provide uh, the, the, the drive for sales this year uh, for, the, for these stocks going forward. So investors will really be looking at sales trends in the second quarter, if there's any sign of weakness there, and also for any commentary for uh, where they could be heading in the next few weeks and months. Okay, and I know that the luxury sector is in focus. If I could move on to the banking sector, though, several European banks are set to report this week. What are we expecting to hear from the sector? Yes, that's right. So we had uh, already Wall Street, a um, number of big Wall Street banks reporting in the last two weeks. JP Morgan posted pretty strong results. Goldman Sachs, uh, some mixed results. We had Julius Baer this morning that repo, uh, posted a, uh, a healthy profit on the back of um, net inflows uh, that were better than expected. And that really sets the context this week for Deutsche Bank, Unicredit, and some uh, large British banks like Barclays and Lloyds. Uh, with Deutsche Bank, the focus will be on uh, revenue development at the private and corporate banking units, uh, which are expected to be uh, posted uh, gains. And investors will be looking at how much that has offset a decline in fixed income trading which the CFO already flagged could be as much as 20%. So investors really be looking at, you know, was it worse? Was it in line with that expectation? And also for confirmation of any share buybacks in the second half of the year, which were planned. Um, as for the British banks, um, earnings outlook for the rest of the year will be key. And as will also a focus on uh, loan impairments, uh, which, depending on what the data shows, could uh, indicate weakness in the broader British economy. Alex, thanks so much. Thanks for the update. Bloomberg's Alex Pearson in Frankfurt for us. Uh, coming up on the program, as some 19,000 people are evacuated from the Greek island of Rhodes. We will get the latest on southern Europe's soaring temperatures. Just how long do we expect them to stay at these kinds of levels? Uh, where is the focus? Is it all in Greece on this Greek island of Rhodes? Is it elsewhere in Greece? Italy also reporting uh, some unusual weather at this time. We will get an update shortly. This is Bloomberg.
almost half of all American women in opposite sex relationships now make the same or more than their husband. That's a record high. According to a new report by the Pew Research Center, a third of U.S. women are in egalitarian marriages, making roughly the same as their husbands, and another 15% of them are the breadwinners. Women with college degrees and no children, as well as black women, are even more likely to make more or the same as their partners. But not everything is a bed of roses. Working wives still carry most of the weight of unpaid labor. Women in egalitarian marriages spend almost twice as much time taking care of the home or a loved one while dedicating less time to leisure. Women are continuing to go out in the formal labor market and contribute and are still bearing all of the load of responsibility that disproportionately falls on them in terms of family care. During the pandemic, in the wake of school shutdowns, the height of the childcare crisis pushed nearly half of American women out of the labor force, a trend that's yet to be reversed. Women are just really struggling to meet the care needs of their family and at the same time are really, really leaning into the labor market. Um, and and I, I don't think we've seen this before in history, to be honest. BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. Get your fixed income fix. Watch Bloomberg Real Yield every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, right here on Bloomberg, your global business authority. This is Marcus today, 30 minutes into your European trading day. Here are your top stories. Standing by, European stocks and U.S. futures trade mixed ahead of a key week for central banks, with the Fed and ECB both expected to hike. The yield curve control strategy will be in focus for the BOJ. Inconclusive, Spanish stocks slump as Socialist Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and his Conservative opponent both claim victory in elections that left them both without the seats to build a majority. We have live analysis from Madrid. Plus, European earnings ramp up as Ryanair and Philips shares drop despite earnings beats. Julius Baer climbs as profit jumped on inflows from Credit Suisse. Welcome back to the program. We've had French PMIs. We're now getting German ones, and they also do not look pretty. So the German manufacturing PMI dropping below 40. Remember, anything below 50 is in contraction territory. And this number comes in below estimates. The estimate was 41. The actual number has come in at 38.8. So that is a very low reading on German manufacturing. To some extent, we, I guess, knew that manufacturing was a weak story. Uh, we've also been looking for uh, weakness, though, to come through in services. And we're getting a bit more of that, even though it's still in uh, expansion territory. So 52 is the reading for services PMI for Germany for the month of July. And that is uh, weaker than had been anticipated again there. So 53.1 was the estimate and 52 is what we got. And the euro it has another leg lower. So we already saw the euro lose its gains at the session so far. That's on the back of the French PMI data that came in weaker than anticipated. That German number really confirming the market's uh, take on this then, that this is going to be a weak set of data for the eurozone. You can see the euro is falling. Uh, so uh, substantial reaction there. We'd also seen bond markets in uh, reacting to that Spanish number. And I can tell you now that we are seeing yields lower in Germany, down by six basis points. Yields, yields lower in France, down by six basis points as well. So substantial reaction there and in Italy down by four. Let's have a quick look at uh, some of the other markets and where we stand right now. In terms of the overall indexes, the Spanish political story certainly to the fore. The Spanish IBEX down by 1.3%, so Spanish banks are under pressure as a result of the politics. Indecision, it, it seems to be the conclusion, and where we go next is a bit of an open question. We'll get analysis from Madrid shortly. But further afield, we also see some weakness coming through on the French market. We're down by four tenths of 1%, the FTSE down by two tenths of a percent, so broadly a little weaker. Although we said mixed in our headlines because actually the U.S. futures point higher, so up a tenth on E-minis, and Nasdaq futures up by two-tenths of a percent. Let's have a look at the sectors then, the ones that are on the move this morning. And this is the picture we have for you right now in terms of sectors. When we last checked in, we had utilities doing badly and also the banking sector. And I can tell you that banks continue to be an area of weakness, and they are the worst-performing sector, down by seven-tenths of one percent. The, the Spanish banking sector has a lot to do with that. Telecoms moving higher. 
and Vodafone has a lot to do with that. With those in mind, let's get a check on the individual stocks. Joe Easton joins us with a briefing. Joe. Biggest gainers in early European trading after around half an hour. Cardo jumping as much as 11%, a big move, the biggest move in around two months for that stock at the moment. This is after they settle that robotics patent dispute with the Norwegian firm Autostall. Autostall will pay Ocado around £200 million to end this dispute. Meanwhile, per Simon, UK home builders back in the headlines. There's a note from Citigroup today saying that some of these stocks have sold off too much. There was a bit of gain last week, of course, following the inflation data. City among the analysts turning more positive upgrading that one this morning. Meanwhile, Vodafone getting a boost. This is mainly due to the service revenue, so mobile phone revenue, particularly in countries like Germany and Spain, as well as the UK where they're listed. That stock jumping 4%. That's a pretty big move for Vodafone. That stock tends to be pretty stable. So that one outperforming the UK market. Meanwhile, Julius Baer, you mentioned earlier, they've got a boost from Credit Suisse flows coming back into that firm. They're gaining market share. However, the CEO was keen to reiterate they do still have strong organic growth. He spoke to Bloomberg earlier, so have a listen to what he had to say. I think we've been very successful with organic growth so far, and it's the best way for us to be completely selective about the talent that we want to employ, about getting the right culture, uh, about the clients that we want to bring in. And so if we have a possibility to grow organically, we are going to do that. That was the Julius Baer CEO, Philip Rickenbacker, speaking to Bloomberg earlier. But I'm also going to have a look at some of these big decliners. Bavaria Nordic in the pharmaceutical space getting absolutely slammed, down 23%. They've announced that a respiratory vaccine didn't meet its targets in a recent drug data trial. So that one is the worst performer on the stock 600 today. Meanwhile, Martin Sorrell's company, S4 Capital, weighing on all the advertising stocks, down 19% in London, coming down to 18%. Now they're warning that some clients are cutting back on ad spending due to the weaker economy. Meanwhile, Philips, this one, the headlines all look positive. Forecast sales improving, but the main concern is about this sleep apnea product, which continues to be recalled, and they are spending around a billion euros trying to fix that issue as well. Finally, Ryanair dropping 4%, some positivity in the last quarter, but they're warning of a potential decline in fares in the next quarter, given they've had a lot of growth in that area. And of course, the other issue is the crazy weather that we're seeing around Europe. And the CFO, Neil Sorahan, spoke to Bloomberg earlier, taking to listen to what he had to say about the weather impact. Yes, there have been some, some, some issues. The weather has been uh, it's unseasonably warm in parts of Europe. Um, but that said, we're still operating full schedules. Uh, we're still getting people in and out. Uh, and people are coming and booking in, in high numbers as, thing, as things are. So we'll just continue to monitor the, the, the situation as we go. In road, for example, you know, we're letting people who want to book onto earlier flights do so. Uh, we're continuing to operate in the airports are open and we'll, we'll continue to do so. But are you seeing people actually going for cooler no, um, you know, we're into 36 different countries across Europe and we've seen no discernible change in booking trends at this point in time. Um, load factor is very high, so a 95% load factor uh, in the quarter just ended and continued to be strong into the, the peak summer period. So no, people are, are booking the traditional routes that they always did and, and we're fully booked on all of our, our, our routes. We've got 3,200 daily flights, 600,000 people a day flying with us um, and, 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 and doing so in numbers. So that was Ryanair's Neil Sorahan speaking to Bloomberg earlier about the weather impact. But that stock down 4% in Dublin, and it will be a bit of a concern if people do start to cut back on bookings, given the warmer weather, Anna, and the airlines around Europe all declining today. I saw IAG slipping earlier. EasyJet as well reported some numbers last week. That's the key focus for the airline industry at the moment. Yes, and the way that airlines are still flying uh, tourists into those areas uh, affected is getting a lot of uh, headlines, of course, here in the UK. Joe, thanks very much for the update. Joe Easton from our equities team. Now, uh, let's stick with that uh, weather, climate-related story. Roughly 19,000 people have been evacuated from parts of the Greek island of Rhodes, where wildfires broke out amid the heat wave that set temperature records across southern Europe. For more, let's get to Bloomberg's Greek Bureau Chief Paul Tugwell with an update. Paul, good morning to you. So bring us up to date then with the situation across the region. Well, um, yesterday, in the last 24 hours rather, a total of 162 wildfires of varying sizes broke out throughout Greece. 
Today, the two main ones are on opposite sides of the country. The one that affected roads over the weekend is still blazing in the southeast. But we also had yesterday a fire that broke out on the island of Corfu in the northwest. In Corfu, that led to the evacuation of nearly two and a half thousand, uh, sorry, two, yes, nearly two and a half thousand people. Uh, 59 of those were evacuated from a beach in northern Greece by the Greek Coast Guard and private vessels. Uh, as you said, in the weekend, we saw the biggest evacuation ever in Greek history in Rhodes because of a wildfire, with 19,000 people evacuated, nearly 3,000 of those by sea and the rest by land. Okay, and, and I understand that some, I mean, airlines are still flying tourists into the region, Paul. Uh, where do things go from here? What are we hearing? We're hearing that some airlines are cancelling flights, others are continuing to send planes, but empty, so that they can repatriate people from uh, roads mainly. Uh, we haven't seen anything yet about the impact on airline operations to Corfu. Um, the Greek authorities are doing their best to help people that may have lost travel documents uh, when they evacuated hotels. Um, they're in, co in cooperation with embassies in roads to try and facilitate, uh, make more quick the repatriation of, of people from roads. Uh, but generally, it's, uh, it's a hectic time for, for the airlines uh, at this moment. Paul, thanks very much. Thanks for the update. Bloomberg's Paul Tugwell in Athens on what some people are experiencing on those holidays. Now, the searing temperatures in southern Europe are starting to threaten food production in the region, with the war in Ukraine already weighing on the global food supply system. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook reports on the short and long-term impacts of extreme heat in Europe. The risks to global food supply are multiplying. Already, Russia's invasion of Ukraine destabilized global fertilizer and grain supplies, but now there's another factor, heat. As Europe bakes under record-breaking temperatures, the effect on food is vast. Too much heat means crops mature very quickly and sometimes can't be picked in time, or they roast right on the branch. Heat and its consequence, drought. Too little water means huge swaths of produce never fully mature. Italian farming association Coldiretti estimates wheat production in Italy will be down 10% this year. It impacts animals too. Extreme heat means cows give less milk. It even exhausts bees hitting honey production. Coldiretti says financial losses will exceed the 6 billion euro figure from last year. All of this bears out in prices. Take Germany, which imports a huge amount of its food from southern Europe. Inflation overall has been huge, but food prices have reached dizzying heights, and everyone suffers as a consequence. It hits the farmers who lose crops, it hits consumers who pay more, and it even puts pressure on the ECB trying to get inflation under control. And while farmers are trying to adapt, it's hard to keep up with a brave new and hotter world. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook on the impact of record temperatures across Europe and with the climate change and those record, uh, record temperatures in mind. Let's get to our morning must read this morning. And this comes from Bloomberg Opinion from our colleague Matthew Iglesias. Uh, the title of it, Kerry's China Trip, Not a Total Loss, is his conclusion. And this follows criticism of the US climate envoy, John Kerry, who's been in China and didn't manage to secure any big changes to Chinese ambitions around climate change. But he cautions us on getting too despondent around the data, saying that, of course, it's, it's easy easy to make, uh, make uh, reductions in emissions in the US context if you move to EV cars, but in a China context that's much harder because if you're moving from bikes to EVs, that's obviously going to drive up emissions uh, rather than drive them down. So he concludes, Greek te uh, sorry, green tech is only green compared to old tech uh, in, in uh, developed markets. So for all the impatience at the pace of change, he says, expressed by activists, emissions in the developed world are in fact falling. The problem is that that is not the global trend. And so I go to uh, uh, some, some uh, commentary from our colleague David Fickling who has an interesting chart on per, per capita emissions and that does set out how things are moving in the wrong direction in China. They are moving in the right direction in many developed markets but of course China coming from a much lower base and our, our colleague Matthew Iglesias concludes that China's per capita emissions will never get to those that we've seen in the US at the end of the last century. Let's put that to one side for a moment and get back to the market story. I just want to tell you what's going on with the Bank of England story and how hikes are being priced into markets. The Bank of England hike bets being uh, paired back by traders. They're putting the odds on a 6% peak at 50%. So a uh, fast-moving story then when it comes to the Bank of England right now. Uh, traders pairing their Bank of England uh, hike bets, putting the odds on a 6% peak at 50%. They had been previously higher than that.
Coming up on the program, Spanish stocks sink as Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez engineers a late swing that denies the Conservatives' People's Party and an outright election win. But both blocs are short of a majority. We're live in Madrid. This is Bloomberg. relations in the United States are much better than when you were growing up in Mississippi, or do you think we've made less progress than you think we should have made? Both. I think, uh, I think that <laughs> much better uh, than when I was growing up. There's so many uh, uh, people who occupy areas, and I never thought I would see them in. But I would have hoped it would be better. It's been a lot of progress. And somehow we are in an area, era now where, in spite of the progress, uh, race relations in certain areas it has become very scary. You know, some of the things that uh, one reads about now remind me of growing up in Mississippi. How did Jeff Bezos realize you could sell anything on the internet? The web was growing at something like 2,300% a year. Anything growing that fast is going to be big. Why did Bill Gates create Control-Alt-Delete? Kind of become the poster child of, hey, couldn't you have made this stuff a little simpler? And what inspired Diane von Furstenberg to create the wrap dress? The wrap dress created me. On the David Rubenstein Show, I uncover the untold stories of the world's most successful leaders, right here on Bloomberg. Markets come down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. This is Markets Today, 15, well, sorry, 45 minutes into the European Trading Day, and the Spanish market is really what we're talking about when it comes to the equity story, down by 1.4% on an inconclusive uh, result from the Spanish election. So let's get some analysis of that. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez has denied his Conservative opponents a majority in Parliament, while the centre-right People's Party won the most seats. The right-wing bloc in total has only 170 parliamentarians. With a wider range of potential partners, Sanchez could potentially muster 172 politicians to his side. Joining us now is Bloomberg's European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, uh, experienced at covering the Spanish political story there, Maria, of course. Let's come to you then on what was quite, quite a nail-biter then in terms of the result we've had here. What do we make of the performance of the Conservatives? They were expected to do better than this. Yes, Anna, and it is a bittersweet victory for the Conservatives because we should make it clear, they won the election, they got the most seats, and they got the most votes, but in Spanish politics, being the winner is not enough. You need a majority in the lower house, that is what you see uh, behind me. The magical number at that point is 176 seats, and the PP is just not there. The Conservatives are nowhere near that number, even if they were to go into a coalition with Vox for some some, this is a far-right party. They describe themselves as Spanish patriots, but even if they were to join, it would still not be enough. What we saw yesterday, again, is that this idea of the far-right, what some may perceive as a far-right, gets a lot of voters out on the streets and they vote to prevent that. And that's exactly what helped the caretaker Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, who came in second, but also did better than expected. Anna, at this point, if you ask me who is going to be the next Prime Minister of this country, there is no answer for that.
that question yet. Both will try, the PP has already indicated, they will try to form a majority. As I say, the numbers do not add up, and the socialists believe they have a window should the conservatives fail. So a lot of questions mm. this morning here in Madrid, but also this idea circulating in the Spanish political spheres that the country's headed for deadlock and potentially a new election. Right, and that was going to be my next question then, Maria. What happens next? I mean, from what you described then, we have a deadlock situation, a, a tight balancing act, and we'll see how things develop over the next 24 hours or so. But do we have a firm understanding of the process from here? Yes, very much. And Anna, it's not even days. We're potentially talking about weeks, even months. And the way it works, again, you have to get a majority of those 176 seats. You need to get a full majority the way the Spanish works in the first round of voting. If you don't get to that number, then in the second round, you need more yeses than noes. Abstentions are key. But even at that point, it's not clear that the conservatives have the numbers they need. The socialists believe that is their window of opportunity. Opportunity, but that is not clear either. At that point, you could be in a situation where it becomes clear no one has a majority. Of course, you have to dissolve both the lower and the upper house and call a new election again. Now, this paralysis, a lot of the questions uh, this morning is, what kind of impact will it have on the Spanish economy? Some analysts believed a PP victory would be pro-business and it would be good for the economy, but we're now facing a scenario of deadlock. What I would say, however, is a lot of the talks, the negotiations that get done between Madrid and Brussels for recovery EU money, that is done at a technical level. It's not really the politicians. So that work should continue behind the scenes. The problematic point would be the Spanish presidency of the European Union. That requires political impetus. And if we do go into a repeat election, you best believe Madrid will be focused entirely on domestic policies, not so much in Brussels. Okay, Maria, thanks very much. Primpex Maria Tadeo joining us there from Madrid with analysis. Coming up on the program, Bund's gain after German manufacturing PMI unexpectedly falls. We've had a weak set of data so far out of Europe. We'll get more on that data next and its market impact. This is Bloomberg. So Fabian, talk to me a little bit about the ocean. It covers 70% of the planet. It gives us food, it gives us jobs, it, it gives us, of course, oxygen. We're taking too many fish out, we're polluting it, we're making it warmer, and only 3% of it is protected. What frustrates you the most about this? The basic frustration is our ignorance. Our ignorance about how integral ocean is to not only our well-being, but to uh, our existence. Uh, and for far too long, we've been using the ocean as an endless resource in a garbage can. Imagine our, our planet is a three-dimensional system. The ocean represents 99% of our world's living space, about 3.4 billion cubic kilometers of volume, within which the vast majority of biodiversity lives and thrives. And, and that's what we're beholden to. That is what makes us possible as a species. you trust everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. Watch Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrell. Weekdays on Bloomberg.
this is markets today 52 minutes into your european trading session and negative across european stocks in particular though not so much actually at the stock the overall european level but in particular negative in spain down by 1.2 percent pressure on the banking sector there as a result of the inconclusive result of the spanish election let me go to uh, some geopolitics and that how that is having an impact on commodity prices wheat prices once again in focus we paid a lot of attention to this last week as we saw that grain deal between russia and ukraine brokered by of course the un and turkey we saw that collapse and as a result we saw higher wheat prices well today we're seeing further pressure upwards on wheat prices wheat wheat up another what is it more than four percent as you see from that chance after russia drone attacks on a danube port we've recently been bringing you uh, news about attacks on odessa port so there's a lot going on when it comes to soft commodities corn prices have also spiked on this and we talked earlier early on in the program about the impact of some of this geopolitics and weather conditions on the european food market let's put that to one side and talk about what's going on at the pmi level and getting a, a sense of where we are on these european growth stories we're joined now by Nurel ali from our markets live team who can talk us through some of the latest uh, market response to the data good morning to you nor uh, let's just recap where we are on german and french manufacturing so the pmi for manufacturing in germany 38.8 coming in with a, a 30 handle which is extremely weak uh, the manufacturing story also coming in weaker in france at 44.5 i suppose manufacturing weakness maybe in the price but it's the services side also showing some weakness now yeah absolutely and it's quite concerning in a season where you'd expect services to get somewhat respite from uh, the, the, you know the vacationing, the summer months that we you would have hoped to see that rise. Obviously, of course, you are seeing that broad-based weakness in the economy, partly in due uh, because of what the ECB has been doing. It's aggressive monetary policy really feeding through into the economy. However, unfortunately for the economy, that means that while inflation is starting to ease, we're also getting some concerns about now the prospects of a recession. Pretty much mm. all. It's a question of when now, right. rather than if. And what does to our ECB thinking for this week is interesting, isn't it? Because the ECB, one of a number of central banks, set to give us its uh, its decision. And I see that the, the bond market is reacting. We're seeing buying of bonds. German 10-year bond down by, uh, in terms of yield, down by five basis points. The French also down by f five basis points in that market as well. I suppose reassessing, yes, we might get the hike in July this week that we're waiting for, but maybe ongoing questions about September. Yeah, absolutely. And those questions will persist up until Lagarde goes on that podium and gives us that commentary of whether or not they're leaning hawkish or dovish. Obviously, it's all about messaging right now, whether it's the ECB, the Fed, and even the BOJ, I'd argue as well, because it's about whether or not we're going to maintain that pressure in terms of messaging. Now, we know that pretty much markets have sealed in or priced in a 25 basis point hike from both the Fed and the ECB later this week. The question is now, whether or not we're going to see more hawkish pressure from Madame Lagarde and, of course, the governing count for, and from Powell later this week as well when it comes to uh, whether or not we're going to get further hikes down the down the road this mm. year. Okay. No, thanks very much. So, uh, yeah, the ECB, the Fed meeting, the BOJ, a lot to think about on the central banking front. For this week, Noor Al-Ali joining us there from our Markets Live team. And you can get up-to-date analysis and insight from Noor and the rest of the Markets Live team. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal if you want to keep across the Markets Live blog. Uh, let's just uh, give you a quick update on where we are across markets then. I mentioned weakness on the Spanish story, and that is weighing on Euro stocks down by four-tenths of 1%. The stock 600, though, pretty flat, so we're seeing some si divergence there. Uh, the DAX actually fairly flat this morning, and the FTSE 100 clawing its way back from negative. Uh, the Euro is certainly falling down by four-tenths of 1% after we saw the weakness of that data. That's led to some buying of bonds, and we see those yields coming down. You can certainly see that in the German two-year, down by seven basis points. That is it for markets today. This is Bloomberg.
don't think we can replicate Tesla. Tesla is a unique uh, because when they found it uh, and then the personality behind it, uh, the product is beautiful, technologically uh, very, very strong. So in many areas, Tesla is Tesla, um, but x is x We want to focus on what we think is important for our customers. Our customer like beautifully designed vehicles, either it's large SUV or sports sedan. We believe we have a very, very appealing uh, family look that our customers is really attracted to. Uh, they like to have user-friendly features inside the cabin that has a technology feel. It's very smart. It enables them to really utilize the vehicle that's different. People ask me all the time, what is the key to being a really good investor? And I tell them it's to surround yourself with and work with the best investors you can find. On Bloomberg Wealth, I'm going to take you to meet the greatest investors in the world, the people that I would like to have managing my money. It is a hurricane over real estate right now. We're in the Category 5 hurricane, and it's sort of a black cloud hovering over the entire industry until we get some relief or some understanding of what the Fed's going to do. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Manish Grani in Dubai. Here's what's coming up on our show today. European stocks drop, but U.S. futures rebound ahead of a key week for central banks, with the Fed and the ECB both expected to hike. Spain's IBEX drops after an inconclusive election with the Socialist Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez, and his conservative opponent, both claiming victory plus... European earnings ramp up, shares in Ryanair drop over caution about traffic growth in the coming year, while Julius Burr profit jumps on inflows from Credit Suisse. Firmly in contraction, the European manufacturing sector, the composite, comes in at 48.9. Services are still expanding. We've had quite a bruising from the French and the German PMIs. Of course, Germany is the lowest reading in 2023 in contraction. France, a 32-month low. But on a pan-European basis, and the reason why you're seeing such a hot uh, flash in Spain is, of course, uh, the election. An undecided, uh, an undecided electorate delivers prevarication at a political level. But the Eurozone private sector contracts. It's a dire start to the second half of the year. So manufacturing is the Achilles heels of the euro. We will see the euro against, uh, and this is a, a much broader measure uh, of the euro, which is its effective exchange rate is at an all-time high, which belies what's happening with the euro dollar there. The euro dollar on the cross, the euro drops like a stone at 110.80. The challenge for the ECB as they meet this week is, of course, the value of the euro on a relative basis to a basket of currency. So that's the state of play on the manufacturing uh, for both the services and the uh, manufacturing size. Let's just take a look across the assets for you. It is a huge week uh, for the central banks. The Fed, the ECB, uh, and the UK will probably deliver one more punch uh, on the upside. Now, with that in mind, uh, it's really a case of hit me baby one more time. As far as the bond markets are concerned, 382 is where we are in tens. Bill Gross says that the bond Bulls, a rally is not on the cards. Hoisington said a credit crunch is on the way. That could take the yields lower. The oil market just uh, breaks a four-week trend on the upside. Uh, we're firmly in backwardation uh, with a 30-cent backwardation. And Masrui, the UAE oil minister, says the cuts are adequate to balance the market. I pop in dollar-yen because the outlier on the tail risk event of the week is, of course, the Bank of Japan. Not expected to remove yield curve control. However, they did disrupt the market last December. Could they do it again? 
with something a little bit more spectacular. And commodities, we'll dig deeper uh, into the commodity spectrum later in the show. Wheat is up uh, on a bombardment of some of the ports uh, around Odessa. Let's talk a little bit more detail about the PMIs. We have Will Horobin from Paris. Will, good to have you with me. Uh, in terms of the overall dynamics here, the services falls to 51.1 from 51.6, but still in expansion. The Achilles heel is manufacturing for the Eurozone. Good morning. Good morning, Manus. Yeah, um, manufacturing is really pulled down. The uh, to, to, we were at eight month low for the um, composite, and for manufacturing, it's a it's a three year low. Um, and you say services is kind of the saving grace in some ways, but it is still slower than it was. The expansion is still slower than it was earlier in the year. So the 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 picture is really quite grisly this morning. Drizzly. But, of course, what's it going to mean for the ECB? And, and I ask that because they're caught between a rock and a hard place, aren't they? They have the euro, which has been flying high, and the, the nominal exchange rate is at an all-time high. I know it's dropped a little bit uh, this morning on the back of the disappointment. But for the ECB, are they really in the one more, one more hike and done? Are we at the end game for the ECB? Well, I think... It's almost I mean, it's completely baked into everyone's expectations that they will raise by 25 basis points to 3.75% for the deposit rate this week. Um, it's extremely unlikely that any of this data would change any of that. But it does, it does make it you know, a bit more cautious for what's, what's going to happen over the summer. Um, what we're really looking at on Thursday is any indication of, of what they think they might do in, in September. And, and this, like, very poor reading for PMI definitely feeds into that calculation. Okay. Uh, a, a lot to consider. Let's see if Madame Lagarde can uh, navigate that news conference uh, later in the week. Will, thank you very much. Will Horobin there on the PMIs. My guest this morning to discuss markets is Human Edge Investment CIO Mads Pedersen. Mads, always good to get your take. I know you're in the process of de-risking at the moment, but please square away for Europe for me. I'm caught between... The effective exchange rate of the euro, which is an all-time high, yeah, it drops a little bit this morning. How much of a, let's say, spoiler will the value of the euro be in the consideration of the forward guidance for the ECB? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Manus. I think it's a, it's a disaster in their own making. Um, the, the exchange rate is clearly too high for the exporters and for the manufacturing sector to struggle or to, to live well in a global manufacturing recession. Uh, we know that the European markets are Europe and China to a large extent, Asia, and so they're struggling there. Mm -hmm. And ECB now needs their policy, they started too late, to work faster. But the problem is they're impatient. So they want to hike and show strength when they actually should show caution and let their policy work. 3.75 is, is, is tight enough for Europe, um, and they have put themselves in this, in this unfortunate place by starting too late. And so, so we don't hold much in European equities, to be clear, if we want to talk a little bit about markets, and we don't hold much belief that ECB will get it right. That's, that's the conclusion. Well, you've always, been, you've always been a man that's been straight to the point on your criticism. What I'm trying to understand from you is you are, from my take, you are de-risking the portfolios. You're going from 60 to 40 on equity, and you're shifting from high yield to high growth bonds. So just... Give me a sense of the scale of your de-risking. Yeah, so we went from 100 to 60 equities and from 60 to 40, depending on whether you look at a growth portfolio or a balanced. And we maintain the high yield. Uh, we have very short duration in the high-grade bonds, so we have taken off a lot of equity beta. We took that off at the end of June uh, because we think it's risky with this manufacturing recession potentially spreading to, to the rest of the world. That's pretty pretty much of a de-risking. And then because the now it's the summer season here in Europe, so we can say because the, the central banks are flip-flopping a bit around on their communication, we still have very high volatility in the government bonds. So there we have pretty short duration. So we have been buying like two-year, four-year duration instead of buying four or six-year duration. So with the aggregate duration in the government bonds we have been buying to protect the portfolios is lower, two years lower than normally. Um, and we have been taking off, okay. you'd say, all the overweight in equities. We held it for seven months before. Okay. What, what are you preparing 
for, it's interesting that you say maybe the manufacturing recession in Europe may be something which is a catalyst for the rest of the world. I'm going to flip that back at you. I'm going to look at the New York Fed, uh, and they've got the probability of a recession. I mean, everybody's telling me it's going to be a, a soft landing, Mads. I, I don't need to worry. Unemployment's going to be grand. We're going to be fine. Five and a half percent rates. We're all going to be, ah, we're off to the races, buddy. New York Fed tells me something different. New York Fed is a 60 percent probability of a recession, and a brutal one if I go by history. Um, is that part of the reason why you're de-risking? Are you in this, are, you're obviously not drinking the soft landing Kool-Aid, are you? Well, I think we have been drinking the soft landing Kool-Aid, as you call it, for seven months. We were all white equities, but now the, the, the world has split in two in the sense that services are doing fine, as, as we just heard, and manufacturing is a deep recession. We need to see the earnings coming true decently before we can go back on an overweight, because at the moment, the, the, the economy is weak and the central banks are unclear about how much more they will tighten. So this is the whole problem is mm -hmm. that there is a big risk that they would like to take us into a deeper recession. And this is exactly what your chart shows, that the unbiased probability, if you look at the data, not if you, you're talking your story, but if you look at the data, as you know, we like to do, then the probability of something going wrong has been going up the last two months because the macroeconomic signals in our models and what you see from the New York Fed, well, that macroeconomic signal is getting weaker. At the same time, the risk around central banks overdoing it, as they sometimes do when they tighten, when they ease, that has increased as well. That's why we need clarity from the central banks and we need clarity from earnings. Okay, the outlier is, is the Bank of Japan. The, the outlier this week could be the Bank of Japan. Just yeah. briefly, I've written down here, what I'm focused on is the cadence the caution and the calibration. Those are the three things for me. And what I want to understand from you is um, the outlier risk, the tail risk this week is BOJ. Where do you think they will be on, 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 the, on the caution that they give to us, the guidance that they give to us? How important is that for the yen trade? It's, it's very important for the yen trade, but they are the ones who have the most to, uh, to benefit from taking it easy. And they are probably going to be the, the one taking it most easy because... They have an economy which is improving for once. They have a market which is doing well, so they have the least reason to do anything to upset this whole thing. They're also, they have been blamed for a lot of things the last 20 years, but they are the ones who have least contributed to the global inflationary problem. So they're in the best place to, to not surprise anyone, to be more cautious than everyone else. They're hiding out. You know the trade mads that sell that, that pad of yours in Gestad. And buy yourself the summer pad, and buy yourself the the, the, win, the winter pad in Japan. Reflect on that, uh, and see whether you want to switch. You want to switch the yen and yen, the, the Swiss into yen for that trade. I'll come back to you. I'll leave you to reflect on that. We'll be back with you in just a moment. That's the Human Age Investment CIO, Mads Peterson. Uh, coming up in the show, European earnings season is well underway with the banks and the luxury in focus. We look ahead to some of the companies due to report right here on Bloomberg. LVMH, Carry, and Hermes. A touch of luxury, sir. CEO Mark Rowan. In January, Apollo closed its $11 billion all-stock merger with Athene Holding. It had already owned 35% of the insurer. Here's what Apollo gets out of the deal. Assets under management. Apollo expects them to double to about a trillion dollars by 2026. Much of that projected growth will come from the merger. And those assets are especially attractive to Apollo. Insurance companies typically go after much more modest returns than buyout investors. That will give Apollo more options for investing the cash. Athene is a steady provider of fee income. It has grown into one of the nation's biggest holders of fixed annuities, those retirement savings products favored by risk-adverse customers. The merger will also allow Apollo to simplify its governance. It gave up its dual-class share structure and adopted a one-share, one-vote plan. The hope is that will eventually lead to Apollo's inclusion in the S&P 500. 
leaders and global leadership are on Bloomberg. We have reformed the whole ecosystem around attracting foreign direct investment. To get everybody to the table was the most difficult thing. Now we're here. The next is consummation. The commitment is there. Now what we need to see is the actions. <laughs> Nobody covers the top global leaders like Bloomberg Television and Radio. Your global business authority. At the time, for example, at the merger of UBS and public facility of US, you for sure remember that. I think uh, the market shares of the two combined banks in Switzerland reached as high as up to 40% and have then again normalized. So from a competitive standpoint, uh, um, no, there's nothing to complain. I think this is an open field. It's an open field for Julius Baer CEO, Philip Reckenbacker. Uh, speaking to me a little bit earlier in the day, the wealth manager's profits jumping on the new inflows from Credit Suisse uh, and other reasons as well. Let's stay with the European earnings story. Uh, we've got big luxury week this week, LVMH carrying and L'Oreal, all due to report uh, for the quarter. We had big disappointment, didn't we? Alex Pearson's with me from Frankfurt, from Richemont. So an inauspicious backdrop to this. What do we need to know for this week? Good morning. Good morning, Manus. Uh, that's right. We have uh, three large uh, luxury goods makers reporting this week. And this comes on the back of Richemont last week posting an unexpected decline in the U.S., which has spooked some investors because um, the U.S. is one of the biggest markets, along with China, for this sector. And any indication of a slowdown there, especially amid expectations that the U.S. could enter a recession in the second half, um, could, it could undermine sentiment in uh, for luxury goods. This also comes uh, on the back of data out of China showing a waning um, economic recovery there and also a deceleration in uh, consumer spending growth. So any indication from uh, LVMH or caring that uh, there was weakening sales trends in the second quarter or that there could be ex or the expectation that it could continue into the next few weeks and months uh, will be closely watched by investors. Now, we've also got a, a Bloomberg story uh, that Bluebell Capital has bought a stake in caring and called for changes at the Gucci brand. I mean, it's not that shocking they're calling for changes at Gucci, but do you think we get any updates on that? Yeah, that's right. So there have been some organizational changes. Bluebell um, reportedly wants to go further with those changes. Uh, it's unclear whether we'll hear anything this week from caring on that, but uh, certainly any updates to the strategy to turn around the brand, which has been trailing its peers in recent years, will be very interesting for the market, and, and any indication that um, discussions on the strategy with shareholders could be happening will also be very interesting. Okay, all eyes down for the big luxury brands this week. Alexander Pearson uh, with the very latest. Let's get back to my gas, Human Edge Investment CIO Mads Peterson. Uh, on China, Mads, you have zero allocation to Chinese equities. That's a bit of a, that's a bit of a, I could use some rude words, but that's a brave call, sir, is it? Or, or is that judicious? <laughs> I, I think it's reasonable. Um, I have tried for 10 years, maybe 20 years, to find out how many buildings, how many apartments there are in China. Everyone talks about the Chinese government, the Chinese technology, the leading in AI, the leading in technology, and they still don't want to tell us how many apartments are there, how many houses are empty, how are the loans doing? And now we see a what I call an exceeding degree of, uh, of communication coordination. Everyone's saying the same thing uh, about it. So maybe it's going to do fine. Maybe the Chinese weather will be fine. I just think the risk is extremely high. Um, and therefore, we prefer to have our allocations to, to the U.S., where you can say what you want, but at least the companies are producing revenues, and we, we kind of know what's going on, kind of. I mean, you've reflected here, Biden is calling Xi a dictator, Previous patterns, Mao, Lenin, Stalin, Putin, etc. I mean, you are, you are, I mean, this is a brutally pessimistic view. I mean, the rest of us are trying to earn a crust here, Mads, on, on the vicarious European China trade, on global trade with China. I mean, this is, this is a fairly big call on China related risks. Could it explode before the end of the year, or is it a long, slow burn? I think it's a long, slow burn. I, I'm not saying she is like these people, I'm saying he's moving in that direction, and that's dangerous. Um, and we saw it the previous week. Uh, suddenly, everyone in a business position with a voice in China coordinatedly comes with statements in the newspaper about how much they like Xi's policy and how much they like everything. 
it's it's not that they could not be right, but when you coordinate to that yep. degree, it looks like other people who have been coordinating top down, doesn't it? And this does not mean that people will believe it. Just because everyone says the same doesn't mean that it's necessarily right. We remember that. That also happened in 2008 in other countries. I'm, listen, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just sort of like having a little bit of a poke. Uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, I, 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 read, I read the copy and why, why, not, why not poke the CIO? 31 measures of yeah. stimulus um, globally. I, I want to take it out to a sort of zoom out to a, a more global level. They are going to do stimulus, Matt. 31 measures, underwhelming, growth has been cut. What is the reflective issue for me from an investment perspective? Is it the yuan is steadied? Is it that I, I push more of an allocation? Again, you've emphasized US. What is the consequence? of an underwhelming response to China's reopening and stimulus? Well, the consequence is that we need to be careful with our global risk. What, what could turn around is, I mean, we have the numbers out of these, as you talked about before, out of the big luxury, luxury sales houses, and they have a good feeling for what goes on in China. So if we see these measures gaining traction, if we see some of the bad loans being transformed into or restructured, then it can be a positive story. It's also positive that China is starting to talk to the world, but they need to regain credibility. And until now, it's not what we're seeing. So I'm just saying we have a global manufacturing recession. We have a problem with the end demand from Chinese construction. We have a problem with the credibility of the communication out of China. So some clear data and what we got on the GDP numbers was anything but clarity. So we need data and we need credibility and then we can start investing. Otherwise, we unfortunately will have to await that the central banks could spoil the game here late in the recovery, and we might have to go defensive, fully defensive in the portfolios. That's what we'll find out in the coming weeks and months. Okay, stay focused. No holiday for you on the beaches, uh, Silico d'Azur. That is the Human Edge Investments CIO, Mads Peterson. Now, you're much more Spanish orientated. Speaking of which, uh, Spain's Socialist Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez, and his right wing opponent, both claiming victory after the elections that left them struggling to build a majority. We're live to Madrid with Maria Tadeo on the ground. This is Bloomberg. like most about your job? I think the, the people. I mean, ultimately, we're a people business. A lot of what my job is as, as CEO of the company is to you know, give those people sort of motivation to tell them where we're going, to encourage them to come up and do their best work, to encourage them to collaborate. Sometimes you sort of think you're almost a psychologist, you know, as you are a business leader, I think, sometimes. And, and so what's your best piece of advice? I, think I love um, pitches. I love being sort of leading from the front, if you like, and spending time with teams. I love to see the work that we're doing. When we pitch for a piece of new business, often when we come together. So I, tell, I guess I try and put myself in the seat of the client. Now, what's the client going to think when they see this work? Are they going to be excited? Is it going to turn their brand around? How is it going to resonate with their consumers? So as much as possible, I can probably I try and play that role. Three prime ministers, four chancellors, an energy crisis, and the soaring cost of living. It's been a hard year for startups, but even in the toughest times, some of the best ideas are born here in the UK. Bloomberg UK's Startups to Watch will profile the brightest companies under 10 years old, with the winners unveiled at the Bloomberg Technology Summit in London in October. Get your entry in by the 7th of August for the chance to have your company profiled and to attend unique networking events. 
Good luck, and we hope to see you there. This month, Bloomberg brings you the latest from China's 14th Annual National People's Congress, including China's COVID recovery, economic outlook, and geopolitical tensions. Continuing coverage this week on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Pulse. The Spanish elections now, and the country looks to be on course for gridlock. An inconclusive set of results left the parties, both ends of the spectrum, without a clear path to forging a government. Who's got the upper hand? Maria Tadeo has been tracking that. It's nail-biter, hasn't it been? Uh, what will the Conservatives make of the results? Ms Tadeo, good day. Yes, Manis, and it is a bittersweet, to some extent, victory for the Conservatives because we should make it clear, they won the election yesterday. They won the most seats and the most votes. But the way the Spanish parliamentary system works, that is not enough. You need a majority. You need a working majority in the lower house that you see behind me. And at this point, they do not have the numbers. And even if they were to go into a coalition with Vox, for some, this is a far-right party, Vox will describe themselves as Spanish uh, patriots, that would still not be enough. So it is unclear that conservatives, having won the election, will actually get to be in power. Now, that opens a window of opportunity for the Spanish uh, socialists, who yesterday were almost celebrating as if they had won the election. They say that should the conservatives fail, they will try to form a different majority. The problem for both men, both on the conservative side, but also the socialists, is the competition Company they keep. It is clear now that Vox continues to be a red line for a big number of Spanish voters that will go out and vote to prevent what they perceive as a far-right government. And for the Spanish caretaker Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, he depends at this point or would depend on Catalan nationalists. And in particular, let's go back in history, he would depend on a man that in 2017, Puigdemont, declared independence from Spain for 30 seconds, but nonetheless did it, and then fled the country in the back of a car. With friends like that, obviously, it's very difficult to form a government. <laughs> it is. One, one, one could say it's a, a reputational risk. Maria, good to see you. Maria today there uh, in Madrid tracking the election results. Coming up on the show, we're going to take a look at the UK economy. How is it faring? What are the latest PMIs there? In, in just a moment. relations in the United States are much better than when you were growing up in Mississippi, or do you think we've made less progress than you think we should have made? Both. I think, uh, I think that <laughs> much better uh, than when I was growing up. There's so many uh, uh, people who occupy areas, and I never thought I would see them in. But I would have hoped it would be better. It's been a lot of progress. And somehow we are in an area, era now where, in spite of the progress, uh, race relations in certain areas has become very scary. You know, 
some of the things that uh, one reads about now remind me of growing up in Mississippi. The names that move markets are on Bloomberg. China has seen slower growth than they expected. Many countries do depend on strong Chinese growth to promote growth in their own economies. For the United States, growth is slowed, but our labor market continues to be quite strong. I don't expect a recession. I think we're in a good path. Nobody covers business like Bloomberg, your global business authority. In a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ, Monday on Bloomberg. This is Bling Bang. European stocks seesaw, but U.S. futures rebound ahead of the key week for central banks, with the Fed of the ECB both expected to hike. Spain's IBEX drops after an inconclusive election, with the Socialist Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and his Conservative opponent both claiming victory. Plus, European earnings ramp up, shares in Ryanair drop after caution about traffic growth in the coming year, while Julius Burr Profit jumps on inflows from Credit Suisse. A very good morning. It's The Pulse with me, Manus Cranny, in Dubai. The PMIs were tragic, to say the least, in Europe, firmly in contraction zone for manufacturing. Yes, the price rises have been less aggressive than they were in the past 29 months, but the result was the euro dropped against the dollar. I can tell you, though, however, the euro is the most expensive on record on a nominal effective exchange rate. And that's something the ECB will take into consideration when they look at this. The private sector contracts. It's a dire start to the quarter. The composite PMI comes in at 48.9. That is below the 49.6. Now, when it comes to the actual narrative from the United Kingdom as well, we just have the breaking numbers coming through across your Bloomberg terminal for that. Uh, here we have services still in expansion, but again, a, a quite a significant drop, 51.5. The market had a survey in there of 53. But wow, on manufacturing, there's the pound. Down she goes, by the way, the pound lost over 1.83% in the space of six days. We're adding to those losses and those wounds. The CPI uh, trailed estimates last week. That took the narrative away from the Bank of England having to go into super hike mode. Uh, the risk of a full 50 basis points came off the table. Now the PMIs on the UK side come in at 45 on manufacturing. That's below the estimate. Uh, and as I say, the composite at 50.7. So on a composite basis, we are not in recession. We're not in contraction in the United Kingdom. But new orders are falling. Uh, and uh, I can tell you this, uh, you're, you're looking at 50.7. Uh, a year ago, that was at 52.1. It's the lowest reading since January of this year. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper into some of these numbers. The UK uh, numbers have just hit the tape. Christine is with me, Christine Aquino. Good to see you, Christine. So these PMIs, I mean, the pound is reacting, but it builds the narrative, I think, for the Bank of England, really, to kill the 50 bips and lock in the 25? Absolutely, Manus. I mean, that's definitely the debate, whether the Bank of England goes one way or another. We still don't really have any indication. And of course, policymakers are already in their quiet period. So we're going to have to wait until next week for all of that. But yeah, just looking at the numbers today, I mean, disappointment across the board. As you mentioned, manufacturing deeper into that contraction territory and services, even though that's still in expansion, uh, still quite a large drop. And I think that gels with the reaction that we've seen in a pound as well. You know, last week or the week before we hit a 15-month high and we really went through some big figures in a pound over a, a, a couple of weeks earlier in July and as you mentioned over the course of six days or so it's lost a lot of that momentum and I think it explains uh, today's number explains a lot of why there seems to be quite the ceiling for the pound right there seems to be this sense that the best of the UK economy is potentially behind us and it's now kind of catching up to the rest of the global economy economy in terms of that slowdown in both demand and also in terms of the economic momentum as a whole. 
And I think this is where the, the bigger debate comes in. Bill Gross warns that he sees a continued bear market in bonds. But then I was looking at this other story from Hoisington. A credit crunch is coming. They are looking at the real average hourly earnings, Christine, coming in at 2.9%. We get U.S. GDP this week as well. So there's a lot on the slate. Where's the biggest outlier risk for you? Mads Peterson says it's in Japan. Where is the outlier risk for you? Well, man, it's I mean, a lot of events this week, as you mentioned. Of course, Japan are very much in focus because they're the last out of the gate, really, to come out of this very easy expansionary policy uh, across the different developed nation central banks. I'm still going to have to watch the Fed, though, of course, because, again, we're going to be watching for not just what they're going to be doing in July, which is, of course, a rate hike that's basically all but nailed on, but I'm really very interested in kind of that forward guidance, right? I mean, if we get an indication from Jay Powell and his colleagues that this might be the beginning of the end of the Fed's rate hiking cycle. That's going to be very, very significant. Or, you know, classic Jay Powell, he's going to want to maintain optionality and want to insist that the Fed is data dependent. That might be the base case scenario. But any diversion from that sort of line from the Federal Reserve is potentially significant moving forward in the second half. Okay, uh, Christine, thank you very much. We'll keep an eye and an ear on all of that in terms of the caution uh, from some of the central banks on the forward guidance. When it came to the earnings for Julius Burr, have a look at this. It was a pretty, pretty strong momentum for uh, Philip Reckenbecker. Profit jumping. Uh, they've got inflows from Credit Suisse. Net income up to 18% in the first six months. He was with me. He, he made it very, very clear that he wasn't that worried uh, about the Credit Suisse UBS merger, that there was room for everybody. We've benefited from the Credit Suisse UBS to some extent, but we've been able to generate net new money from a much broader array of sources. So not banking on the failure of Credit Suisse to fill the coffers there. Ryanair, uh, so Julius Bar up 7.71%, Phillips uh, down 6.8%, Ryanair uh, down 3.68%. Maybe they're going to have to cut for... This is really interesting because we've been traveling like Billio, and I've done three weeks of global travel, European travel. I was everywhere, right? The planes were full. He's got a 95% fill on the seats, but they're saying that they may need to use some fur stimulation. They're, they're, they're still sending the flag up. Maybe we're running to the end of this gorging on stimulus that we have had in a post-COVID world. When Ryanair are telling you that they may need to cut furs to fill those planes, I put it to you that is a very prescient guidance. Now, when it comes to Phillips, uh, they, they order drop outweighs the outlook. I think that's the bottom line for them. Second quarter operating profit exceeded expectations, but you're looking at an order drop, which is weighing on the market. They've got fewer orders uh, coming in than they would like. The chief executive officer, Roy Jacobs, uh, said in an interview this morning. So keep an eye on that. Uh, two canaries in the coal mine from manufacturing and the consumer. Be warned. Coming up, Soaring temperatures across Europe begin to threaten the food production. We look at what it might mean for the global food system on Bloomberg. Tesla is a unique uh, because when they found it uh, and then the personality behind it, uh, the product is beautiful, technologically uh, very, very strong. So in many areas, Tesla is Tesla, um, but x is x -Pen. We want to focus on what we think is important for our customers. Our customer like beautifully designed vehicles, either it's large SUV or sports sedan, we believe we have a very, very appealing uh, family look that our customers is really attracted to. 
Uh, they like to have user-friendly features inside the cabin that has a technology feel. It's very smart. It enables them to really utilize the vehicle that's different. studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West, only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. Yes, there have been some, some, some issues. The weather has been uh, unseasonably warm in parts of Europe. Um, but that said, we're still operating full schedules. Uh, we're still getting people in and out. Uh, and people are coming and booking in, in high numbers as, thing, as things are. So we'll just continue to monitor the, the, the situations we go. In road, for example, you know, we're letting people who want to book onto earlier flights do so. Uh, we're continuing to operate in the airports are open, and we'll, we'll continue to do so. But are you seeing people actually going for cooler no, um, you know, we're into 36 different countries across Europe and we've seen no discernible change in booking trends at this point in time. Um, load factor is very high, so a 95% load factor uh, in the quarter just ended and continued to be strong into the, the peak summer period. So no, people are, are booking the traditional routes that they always did and, and we're fully booked on all of our, our, our routes. We've got 3,200 daily flights, 600,000 people a day flying with us um, and, 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 and doing so in numbers. That was the Ryan Air CFO, Neil Sorhan, speaking to Lizzie Bowden a little bit earlier on, uh, on the consumer and the earth uh, impacts from uh, the heat wave that we have. And it's continuing really to grip the whole of Southern Europe. Around 19,000 people have fled parts of Greece, hit by wildfires amid record temperatures across the region. The Greek Coast Guard led the efforts to rescue tourists and locals from the island of Rhodes. And the blaze capped a week of extreme weather in the region. You've got hailstorms and a tornado in Italy, heavy rainfall in Western Balkans as well. Well, the searing temperatures in Europe are starting to threaten the food production in the region, with the war in Ukraine already weighing on the global food supply. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook reports on short and long-term impacts of extreme heat in Europe. The risks to global food supply are multiplying. Already, Russia's invasion of Ukraine destabilized global fertilizer and grain supplies, but now there's another factor, heat. As Europe bakes under record-breaking temperatures, the effect on food is vast. Too much heat means crops mature very quickly and sometimes can't be picked in time, or they roast right on the branch. Heat and its consequence, drought. Too little water means huge swaths of produce never fully mature. Italian farming association Coldiretti estimates wheat production in Italy will be down 10% this year. It impacts animals too. Extreme heat means cows give less milk. It even exhausts bees hitting honey production. Coldiretti says financial losses will exceed the 6 billion euro figure from last year. All of this bears out in prices. Take Germany, which imports a huge amount of its food from southern Europe. Inflation overall has been huge, but food prices have reached dizzying heights, and everyone suffers as a consequence. It hits the farmers who lose crops, it hits consumers who pay more, and it even puts pressure on the ECB trying to get inflation under control. And while farmers are trying to adapt, it's hard to keep up with a brave new and hotter world. I've had my inbox filled with move to Ireland. It's uh, not as hot and perhaps a little bit less expensive. That is Bloomberg's Oliver Crook on the impact of record temperatures across Europe. Let's get a little bit more now with Caroline Bain. She's the chief commodities economist at Capital Economics. Caroline, thank you for being with us. El Nino, we are in the grip of El Nino. Uh, how underpriced is this in the commodity risk spectrum? I think it's starting to get priced in. Um, and as your previous um, article was, was saying, it's not just that extreme, extremely high temperatures in Europe. It, this is a global phenomenon. We've seen record temperatures in China. Southeast Asia had a drought last year. And on top of all that, an El Nino weather phenomenon is on its way, which is a, a warming phenomenon. It brings very dry weather to Asia and very wet weather to Latin America. 
Um, it typically results in, in lower production of some of the, the, the crops that are concentrated in those areas, so for example, palm oil in Southeast Asia. It, it does feel as though there's a bit of a perfect storm um, developing in, excuse me, in agricultural markets, not least because of last week the Black Sea Grain Deal Initiative um, expired and Russia has started targeting Ukrainian food export facilities. So yet another um, sort of factor driving, driving prices higher. Well, we've certainly seen an explosion in wheat. That's geopolitics at play. All ships will be treated as military cargo. There's been a tax on Odessa. When you look at that ramp higher in wheat, um, just talk to me from the supply side. We've now got a vicious heat wave in Europe. Where is the biggest supply issue for the world when it comes to wheat? And how much more aggressive do you expect wheat prices to go? Um, we're in the process of revising up our forecast. We had expected the wheat price to ease back a bit this year after it's extremely high last year. Um, but we're, we're revising that up. Um, looking at Europe, Europe's production of wheat, quite a lot of it is concentrated in the northern half of the region. And even France, um, which has experienced heat waves in the south, their harvests look on track, perhaps a, perhaps a little lower. So we're not hugely concerned about actual sort of European production of wheat. The, the end of the Black Sea grain deal, though, is, is, a, is a problem, um, as about 40 to 50 percent of Ukraine's um, wheat is coming out of the Black Sea. And the destruction of port facilities, et cetera, suggests that you know, it's going to be a while before Black Sea exports can, can resume on any scale. Um, it, it's a big question mark how much Ukraine can get out um, over land um, and, to, and whether that can then be transported to markets in Africa and the Middle East who are typically Ukraine files. Carolyn, thank you so much. We're just gonna we're just gonna uh, uh, pause here, Caroline. Uh, we're just having a few uh, a few signed issues there. Our apologies to our viewers uh, on the signed during that interview. Caroline Bain, Chief Commodities Economist at Capital Economics, our guest this morning uh, on wheat and all things commodities. Coming up, the bird flies. Twitter bids farewell to the logo. We'll ask what the future holds for the social media platform right here on Bloomberg. CEO Mark Rowan. In January, Apollo closed its $11 billion all-stock merger with Athene Holding. It had already owned 35% of the insurer. Here's what Apollo gets out of the deal. Assets under management. Apollo expects them to double to about a trillion dollars by 2026. Much of that projected growth will come from the merger. And those assets are especially attractive to Apollo. Insurance companies typically go after much more modest returns than buyout investors. That will give Apollo more options for investing the cash. Athene is a steady provider of fee income. It has grown into one of the nation's biggest holders of fixed annuities, those retirement savings products favored by risk-adverse customers. The merger will also allow Apollo to simplify its governance. It gave up its dual-class share structure and adopted a one-share, one-vote plan. The hope is that will eventually lead to Apollo's inclusion in the S&P 500. 
How did Jeff Bezos realize you could sell anything on the internet? The web was growing at something like 2,300% a year. Anything growing that fast is going to be big. Why did Bill Gates create Control-Alt-Delete? Kind of become the poster child of, hey, couldn't you have made this stuff a little simpler? And what inspired Diane von Furstenberg to create the wrap dress? The wrap dress created me. On the David Rubenstein Show, I uncover the untold stories of the world's most successful leaders, right here on Bloomberg. Conversations that matter, insights that you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Manish Cranny in Dubai. So the simultaneous release of the movies Barbie and Oppenheimer helped the U.S. box office revenue this weekend more than double from a year earlier, more than $300 million. An estimated 200,000 moviegoers bought the tickets to see both the new films on the same day, a phenomenon that was dubbed Barbenheimer. Now, it helped cinemas turn in the best weekend since the Avengers Endgame made its debut in April 2019. So uh, Barbie's journey from the toy box to the big screen has been a long one. And on the latest episode of The Circuit with Emily Chang, executives at Mattel, who make the iconic dolls, discuss how they transformed the character into a blockbuster movie hit. The Barbie movie was kind of in development hell, wasn't it? How did you pull it out of that? Our approach was different. When we started this journey, the underlying objective was to create quality content, quality experience, and make a movie that people would want to watch. Kreis wasn't interested in making glorified toy ads, so he brought in a producer with big screen chops. You produced Dallas Buyers Club, which was nominated for an Oscar for Best Picture. What convinced you to come in-house and make movies for Mattel? the bench of, of the amazing IP that Mattel has. I mean, the hundreds and hundreds of brands owning Fisher Price and American Girl and 8-Ball and Hot Wheels and Barbie and Jack in the Box. It just, the list went on when I really, you know, looked deeply into it. I thought, my God, I grew up on so many of these brands. I have two children. They played with Barbie. They played with American Girl. And, you know, we have so much going on in the world right now. I mean, it's just a very kind of messy, crazy time, I think, for everybody. And I thought, wow, what better place to then to work at a toy company? You're making things that actually bring smiles to children's faces that actually inspire wonder and imagination and just unlock incredible things for children and, and for adults and the nostalgia that I had for all of these toys. Barbie has a complicated history. She is a cultural icon and a flashpoint. What's the goal with the new Barbie movie? Everybody has a relationship with Barbie. She's been around for so many decades, and everybody knows who Barbie is. She's probably the most famous woman in the world. She's been to the moon. She's been president. <laughs> she's done all of these things that, you know, women aspire to be. And I think that, you know, in hiring somebody like Greta Gerwig, who I think is a... Uh, brilliant filmmaker, but she has a singular vision and an authentic voice as a filmmaker, bringing somebody like that, that has just kind of a different perspective that is outside of the box, that's going to do something differently to something like Barbie, I feel like that's when sort of greatness occurs. This is Barbie's first theatrical release in her 60 plus year history. Why was now the right time and not 10 years ago or 20 years ago? It's interesting that of all of the movies at Mattel Films since we started on this journey four and a half years ago, that this is the first movie. You would think in a lot of ways, like, that's a lot to live up to because it is an open-ended conversation. She is an open-ended conversation. Like, what is that movie? Greta had sort of this idea, and I remember we met with her, and she, she said, I have this idea of a high heel and a Birkenstock. And that was sort of her like leaping off point of like what this movie should be. And I thought, God, that's kind of brilliant. Kind of brilliant. I want what Barbie's on if she's 60. Uh, Mattel, executives there with Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Now brace yourself because the Twitter CEO, Elon Musk, has chosen a new logo for Twitter. The billionaire is replacing the signature Bluebird with a stylized 
X. He's projected this all over uh, one of the buildings uh, in terms of what's happening here. He revealed the branding for Twitter um, in a tweet. So what does this all mean? I mean, the, the bird is 17 years old, but Elon has aspirations to create this product and take it to the, the payment services world. Let's get to Aggie Cantrell. She follows all things tech. She's just hot-footed it back from a New York trip. She's more inspired by tech than ever. Aggie, what's behind <laughs> the latest move? Good morning. <laughs> Hi, Manners. Yes, so essentially we have heard him already talk about X.com, about the everything app that he wants to build. He's been talking about this since October, since the original acquisition of, of Twitter. But now it seems like they're really pushing ahead with removing that Twitter brand. So it was a couple of ambiguous tweets from Elon Musk about what the, exactly this was going to mean. And then we got more from Linda Yasserino from the current Twitter CEO uh, when it came to essentially integrating audio post, video, and also payments and banking. This is billed as some sort of WeChat, a WeChat analog um, for the Twitter space. And so essentially X.com, the idea of it, is something that Musk has been looking at for a long time. His original platform, uh, his payment platform back in the 90s was called X.com. He That was then merged with PayPal. And of course, we've heard of SpaceX and Model X. He has a bit of an obsession with the letter X. And so now when we're looking at this new X.com, Right now, it doesn't look like there's much beyond it just being the rebrand. But if you type in x.com at the moment, as I did in the Bloomberg office in Berlin earlier today, it just redirects you to Twitter. There you go. Bring, you know, it reminds me just like Simon Carl. Do you know, you're probably too young, but you remember the X Factor kind of thing? Um, that's, uh, that's, you I know, do. the inspiration for Elon. You do. Okay, okay. You probably were around for a bit. Even the head of the Middle East here is standing up. He remembers the X Factor. Yes, he wants to push me on to the X Factor. That's my next career. Uh, let's continue the conversation about Twitter. Uh, <laughs> because, of course, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of upheaval. But what does it mean for the brand, Aggie? What does it mean for the brand, briefly? Well, I think what you're saying about the X Factor is actually the point, is what is Twitter's X Factor? What is the thing that Twitter has that other people don't? And the thing is, a lot of that is the brand and the loyalty of it. So what I'm interested to see going forward is now that we've seen real competitors to Twitter come out, like threads from Meta, what does Twitter still have that it's offering to its users that maybe they won't find on another social media platform? And Twitter is a long-standing brand. We talk about tweeting just as we talk about Googling. So I really would like to see See what this means going forward for the app if it can still maintain a new strong brand with this x.com in the same way that Twitter has built up over the last uh, one and a half decades. Aggie, thank you very much. Let's see. Yeah, but of course, you've got to be a little bit wary. You sign up for threads, and then you've got to demolish your Instagram account to get yourself off that. It's all, it's all very, very intricate. Aggie, well explained, as ever. Aggie Cantrell in Berlin. There's only two things you need to know about the implosion in the European manufacturing and also the pound under pressure. Both the PMIs in the UK and in Europe are very much on an oppressive run. The pound is down for the seventh day in a row, the longest run of losses since the start of the pandemic in 2020. Is this peak pound? So is there more pressure when you're trying to win a basketball championship than when you're trying to please investors? Where's the greater pressure? Oh, I think, I think it's definitely trying to win a championship. Um, it's hard because a lot of, like when you invest, and you know this, when you're investing 
Um, you can control a lot more things when you know on a basketball court you can't control whether somebody's going to make a shot you've got to get lucky and what's the greater pleasure making five times your money on a distressed debt investment or winning the nba championship they're both fabulous uh <laughs> I, I i wish i could do one each year that would be great but um i, I think there's a great feeling in being right on an investment that um, you've done a tremendous amount of work, and you've made money for your clients, which I think is great. I think winning a championship is, it, it's a very surreal feeling because there's a whole city or state that is actually behind you. Um, you know, we had 70,000 people at the finals, and we had them all outside. We had 17,000 in the stands, and then literally like 60,000 people outside. Um, and when we won, like just the joy that you had brought to the city was phenomenal. People ask me all the time, what is the key to being a really good investor? And I tell them it's to surround yourself with and work with the best investors you can find. On Bloomberg Wealth, I'm going to take you to meet the greatest investors in the world, the people that I would like to have managing my money. It is a hurricane over real estate right now. We're in the Category 5 hurricane, and it's sort of a black cloud hovering over the entire industry until we get some relief or some understanding of what the Fed's going to do. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, trying to open... This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. Why do the biggest names in business choose Bloomberg? That is a great question. It's a great question. Great question. Great question. Best question I get all night. Bloomberg. Top experts. Great questions. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. A pivotal week for central banks kicks off with euro area PMIs that point to economic malaise. The Fed and ECB are both expected to hike, while yield curve control will be the focus for the BOJ. Earnings season ramps up. Alphabet, Meta, Intel could shed more light on how AI is upending the tech industry, while Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Ford, and P&G will provide a read on the health of the consumer. And in Spain, the IBEX drops after an inconclusive election. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez denies his right-wing opponents a majority in Parliament. We're live in Madrid with the latest. Happy Monday. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Kriti, I was ready to say what a busy week it was about to be with earnings with central banks, but it's already started with that really, really bad European data. Yeah, and I think the ripple effects of that are going to be crucial, especially when you see stateside the story of what you're seeing in Europe and what that really means, not just for the ECB, the BOE, but potentially for the Federal Reserve as well. Remember, it is a global story that we are seeing and moving the bond market. We'll get to that in a moment, Danny. Right now, some green on the screen across the board. S&P features higher by about two-tenths of 1%, 45.72 for our radio audience on those contracts. With some important to keep in mind is, again, no major conviction to the upside. But if you look at what is actually moving underneath the hood, it is a lot of those tech names that are pushing it higher. Take a look at the bond market, though, and this is where that data stuff comes in handy. What Danny was just mentioning, that 10-year yield coming down a little bit to the tune of about two basis points. Look, two basis points doesn't sound like that much for the 10-year yield, but it did move by that margin just on the European data alone. So 381 on that note as well. And remember, when we look at yields coming down, we think the dollar is going to follow, and that is generally true, especially given what you are seeing across the Atlantic. But I want to bring your attention to what we're seeing across the Pacific as well. Dollar you want at about 721, we'll call it strength by about three tenths of 1%. Remember the last time that we had uh, this pair cross that 7.2 level, we were really looking at China stepping up some of that stimulus, stepping up some of those concerns about really the slowdown in the Chinese property market and how much they're going to intervene in that story. So keep an eye on that as we talk about the Chinese growth story. And of course, in that same vein. Bloomer commodities are always going to be in focus. Remember, gold, copper, oil, they are all down on the day, but agriculture leaving the index higher to the tune about four tenths of one percent, Danny. Pretty so much going on here in Europe. Let me walk you through the board because, again, it was that data. It was a big surprise, and it's really unfortunate timing for FX traders considering the latest CFTC data shows a 
net bearish positioning on the dollar of currencies, including the pound, including the euro, to the biggest amount on record. If you're holding uh, the dollar versus the euro, if you're shorting this pair, uh, it was a good day for you. But if you've gone long for the euro, you are getting smoke today because we saw so much euro area PMI disappoint. We're going to get into that in just a bit. In Germany, though, it was its worst manufacturing PMI re reading since COVID. Hence the reaction we've gotten. Euro weakens by about half a percent. It's now trading just under 111. UK two-year yield, we had some UK data. Disappointed, not by as much, but it's following the trend of a big rally in European bonds. So those yields come in by about 11 basis points. We've backed off the peak of a 5.8% peak rate for the BOE. We're now at 5.7. Euro area stocks, somehow among all of that, they're gaining a lot of different earnings stories impacting things here. But the real disappointment, and again, Kriti, I know we'll get into this in a moment, so I won't steal Maria today as uh, a thunder, but Madrid's IBEX falling about seven tenths of one percent. Yeah, the geopolitics, the monetary policy, a lot to digest. But I think the trade this morning, to your point, Danny, really centered around that euro area PMI data. Let's put that into some perspective here. I want to show you a chart for our TV mm -hmm. audience. Our radio audience, stick with me. Basically, shows that PMIs are showing some pretty widespread contraction on the continent. For our radio audience, you're basically seeing the line go down, down, down for the likes of UK, Germany, France, and even the United States as well. Germany, France, the UK kicking off the third quarter with the contractions, mostly in their private sector economies, sustained weakness in the manufacturing sector as well, and that's spilling over to the services part of the economy as well. I want to bring in Bloomberg macro strategist Simon White, specifically to talk about what the read-through might be on an ECB that's dealing with a lot of different cross-currents. Uh, yeah, I mean, they were pretty dreadful PMIs. Um, I think the, you know, earlier on in the year, we saw this little bump in PMIs, and I think that created this bit of kind of ephemeral uh, optimism, which was maybe um, a little bit too kind of premature. Um, but really, uh, yeah, I mean, look, the ECB is going to, they're going to hike this week, almost certainly. Um, but after that, I think it's going to be data dependent, and things could change enough by September, um, and they could suddenly, you know, they could revise basically where they are and, you know, we could be at the end of uh, the hiking cycle for now. I think they'll have to maintain the hawkish language, though. Um, obviously, they're going to try and aim for a, a higher for longer uh, kind of mantra, you know, the same thing as the Fed. Um, but really, they will uh, get to the point where they're realizing that the uh, economy is uh, not quite as strong as they would like. I mean, on the other side of things, Simon, I mentioned this, that at the moment, there's a record amount of bearish dollar bets at the moment in this market. And we're also going to not just get the ECB, but we're going to get the Fed. We're going to get the BOJ. Does the market look a little bit too one-sided heading into all that, especially now that we have this European data in hand? Yeah, I mean, I think for Europe, potentially. Um, I think the Fed, uh, obviously, they're probably going to go as well. Um, I think if they had not sort of promised so much that they were definitely going to go, they might not. Uh, the CPI now is at the moment very soft in the US. I think later on that'll change, but that's a different story. Um, uh, but they're going to do their 25. You've seen the jobs market, you know, just beginning to slow down claims, things like that. So, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, it gets to the point where that's probably the last hike for the Fed. Um, and for the ECB, as I say, they could get to September. They're going to be data dependent. The Bank of England, I know that's not this week, but they're the ones that I think are going to end up over tightening. Um, you know, they, they have uh, quite a few hikes already priced in, but the economy is, um, you know, I think less, less resilient in the UK yeah. than it is in the other areas. Um, so, Simon, I got some breaking headlines for you that I want you to digest here from the BOJ. The BOJ is said to mull big increase in 2023 inflation outlook. They're said to mull raising the full year CPI forecast to around 2.5%. To me, that's inflation above their target. If they are thinking this, do you think that means we might be in for a change on Friday? Uh, you can never predict what the BOJ is going to do. Uh, at the minute, it sounds like they want to run things a bit hot. It's been so long that they have not had inflation for. Um, and I think they don't want to prematurely uh, tighten and then maybe scupper uh, any progress that's been made. They're seeing wage increases uh, as well. So things are moving in the right direction. I think a lot of people obviously think they're potentially threatening uh, in the longer term financial stability. Um, but look, I think uh, if they are going to tweak it, yes, again, the BOJ can do anything. They can always surprise. So I, I'm not going to 
put myself out there and say that it's going to be this week, but I, I think they will Simon. do soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably a safe decision, Simon. Of course, on those headlines, you're seeing dollar yen tick lower as well. 141.39 on that currency pair. Bloomberg, Simon White hitting the BOJ, ECB, Federal Reserve all in one. What can't he do? We go, of course, from Tokyo to Madrid, turning to the Spanish election. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez lives to fight another day, though Spain looks on course for gridlock after inconclusive results left parties on both ends of the spectrum without a clear path to forge a government. Joining us now uh, live from the ground in Madrid is Bloomberg's European correspondent Maria Tadeo. Maria, what will the conservatives make of this result? Well, it's a bittersweet victory for the Conservatives because we should make it clear and stress this. They won the election. They won the most seats and the most votes. But the way the Spanish parliamentary system works, that is not enough. You need a majority. You need a working uh, majority in the lower house that you see right here behind me. And the numbers simply are not there for the Conservatives, even if they were to go into a coalition with Vox. Remember, some will say this is a far right Vox. What they say is that they are simply quote, Spanish patriots, that would still not be enough. And that is a window of opportunity, potentially, for the Socialist Party. They came in second, but yesterday almost celebrated as if they had won the election. At this point, the crucial question is, who will be the next Spanish prime minister? The reality is, we don't know. Will there be a next Spanish prime minister out of this election? That is also unclear. And potentially, what we see or will see are weeks, months of political deadlock, and maybe even a new election. What happens in the meantime, Maria, if it is this tight balancing act like you're describing between the different blocks? Yeah, especially if they both uh, try and fail. Again, you're into months of political paralysis and a new election. Now, some strategists suggest that this kind of paralysis would be bad for the economy, although I should note a lot of the technical work that gets done between Madrid and Brussels is on a technical level. These are not politicians that handle files like this. But, of course, the markets did not like or will not like months of uncertainty. The question and the one issue, of course, that I would really stress is that fundamentally both the conservatives and the socialists face the same difficulty and that is the company they keep it is clear now that for a number of spanish voters the idea of a government that includes what they perceive as a far right uh, party will get them out on the streets and will get them out to vote against that for the socialists however if they were to form another government they would depend on catalan nationalists and particularly of a man who i'm sure you remember puch de mont who declared independence from Spain in 2017 for 30 seconds, but nonetheless did it, and then <laughs> fled the country in the back of a car. With friends like this, of course, it's very difficult to form a government. Yeah, Maria, I remember that moment uh, quite, quite uh, vividly. I think I met you a couple months after that had happened. Maria Tadeo in Madrid covering all the developments uh, there in Spain. We go from European politics turning to the tech sector. Twitter says goodbye to its signature blue bird logo as Elon Musk replaces it with a stylized X, calling it part of a broader overhaul of the company. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Aggie Cantrell all over it. Aggie, is this just another kind of Elon Musk branding scheme, or is there more to it here? Yes, yeah, so first of all, this is really a return to roots for Elon Musk. He has a bit of an obsession with the letter X, and his for, his company, this payments company in the 90s is called X.com. Since then, we've seen SpaceX and the Model X at Tesla, and so this was part of a broader idea that he had in the first place when he first uh, announced the acquisition of Twitter, which was that he wanted to create an everything app, sort of a WeChat analog. And that was alluded to as well and elaborated uh, in these recent tweets, and it was elaborated on by the current CEO, Linda Yasserino, who said in a series of tweets uh, earlier that this was going to be integrating things like posts, audio, video, and also payments. So it is about building out this broader app. So there does seem to be a bigger vision here. But really, right now, when you type in x.com, as I did earlier in the Bloomberg office in Berlin, uh, all you do is get redirected to the Twitter platform. So right now, it feels like it is this immediate rebrand, and then we'll see what happens from there. Yeah, we also need to figure out if it's still going to be called to tweet, because to x makes uh, is an absolute nonsense phrase. It makes no sense. Um, <laughs> Aggie, for those tech companies that are still public, it's it's another really big week. We have Microsoft and Alphabet just in one day. 
tomorrow. I'm curious what the AI race will look like between the tech giants. What are we expecting to hear from them? Yes, so essentially we heard a lot about AI the last time that these companies reported this year. Um, from Meta, from Alphabet, and from Microsoft who are all reporting this week, AI is going to be a core focus. And I think what analysts are going to be looking at now is, okay, you've all committed to this. You want to be developing in this space. We need to understand what that actually looks like, what that means in terms of growth going forward, in terms of investment. Because also this shift to AI isn't a... a zero-sum game for these companies. It costs a lot of money. Um, it costs a lot of extra effort, extra manpower, and a huge amount of, of processing power in order to shift a lot of these uh, services that they're providing over to AI and in order to develop new ones. So this is something that they're all committed to, and it's something that analysts were very keen to see in the last round, but I think uh, in the last earnings reports. But I think this time around, people will want to know what that really looks like. All right, Aggie, thank you very much. That is Bloomberg's Aggie Cantrill. Again, a crazy, crazy busy week. Coming up, we're going to take a step back and talk about the Wall Street underdogs. They're on a hiring spree for top talent as deal-making slump forces big banks to downsize. We're going to have more on today's Big Take Next. And from banking deals to tech deals, we'll discuss digital mergers and regulation with the former UK Competition and Markets Authority CEO later this hour. Also, we're going to discuss the PMI data out of Europe, a potential upgrade from the BOJ on inflation forecast, and news coming from China that the Politburo will be holding their meeting on Monday. We have so much to discuss with Rafaela Tenconi, chief economist at ADA Economics. This is Bloomberg. best investment advice you've ever been given by anybody? The compound interest, the compounding of returns is an incredible miracle of business, finance, and human existence. Everything you learn is additive every day, and if you keep at it and don't quit, it's an incredible miracle. And it's, and it's not just interest. It was, it was always said about compound interest returns, compound business returns, compound human returns. They're all very additive because you learn every day. And if you keep at it, it's very, very um, uh, helpful. In your observation of investors, what do you think is the biggest mistake that average investors make? Selling at the wrong time. And they sell when the prices go down? Yes. Or yes. Not keeping. Look, people have conviction or they invest for the, if they invest for the right reasons, just keep at it. Business Week Radio, live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, aren't you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed yeah. does potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Now, today's Big Take takes an exclusive look inside the turnover at investment banking giants as M&A deals slump. Let's bring in Jan Henrik Forster, senior reporter for investment banking. Um, I mean, it's been a, a strange time for investment banking in, in general, Jan. So taking a step back, this turnover, why is it so bad right now? Why is there so much of it? Well, certainly there are a lot of cuts, right? Goldman, Morgan Stanley, they are all going through the biggest rounds they, they actually ever seen. And then obviously Credit Suisse disappeared. 
which was a big investment bank. And kind of the observation we made here is that there's a lot of turnover. I call it the great rotation of bankers moving around places. And this kind of led to a situation where smaller banks or banks who are rebuilding, or boutique banks, they are hiring all these people, paying top dollar. Um, that's certainly one element. And you kind of see this situation where, yeah, basically people move around and the whole kind of landscape of investment banking is shaking up a little bit. Now the question is, what does it mean for those who are catching up? Well, uh, tell us just that in terms of the kind of broader banking sector. Is this a trend that's really going to stick? Hmm. But there is a lot of uncertainty, right? There's still a debate about where terminal rates will end. And M&A has slowed down completely. So there are no fees. Private equity has gone in retreat mode, right? They're you know, both on the buy side and the sell side. Uh, and banks are cutting, right? So I, I guess like, if somebody like Goldman makes a view, oh, volumes are not coming back, so we are cutting, you can imagine that this is go well, might be going on for another year or two. Now, the question is, guys like Deutsche Bank or Santander, can they really make a difference here by hiring a lot of people now and catch up with kind of the Wall Street, the big Wall Street guys? Um, and that's, yeah, I mean, it, it might be either a costly error or they get it right, and we will see different uh, type of league tables in the future. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of uh, PE hope it's, it's going to come back and those banks will get some business. Jan Henrik, thank you so much for joining us as always. That's Bloomberg's Jan Henrik Forrester. All right, some breaking lines to share with you coming out of China. The China Politburo saying that they will meet on Monday, also saying that they vow to optimize and adjust property policies. They also say that they're going to effectively present and resolve debt risks. They're also vowing to drive platform firms' healthy developments. Again, Kriti, we're all waiting for that Politburo meeting to see if they announce any type of large-scale help for the economy. Yeah, it's interesting that it's coming at a time when even over the weekend, for example, Henry Kissinger was kind of tapped as being someone who could broker some of those deals. But what's interesting to me is kind of what the Chinese Politburo puts their emphasis on. They're saying, look, we're going to try to boost car and electronic products consumption, really speaking to the Chinese consumer and the strength there. They're also saying we're going to try to enliven the capital market and boost investor confidence. Danny, we know this has been an issue given the recent outflows out of China. Yeah, and we also learned over the weekend a great scoop from the team that China has been meeting with international funds trying to court more investment. But again, another scoop from the team that China did not plan on large-scale help, on any sort of large-scale programs that come in. So again, the Politburo, though, vowing to optimize and adjust property policies. A little bit of strength now coming in um, from the yuan. It's still falling, but uh, pairing some of those losses. All right, coming up, Priti and I are going to turn our attention back to this earnings season. Goldman's David Costin calling for recent S&P 500 valuation expansion. Quote, reasonable, despite higher rates. We're going to have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. ministers, four chancellors, an energy crisis, and the soaring cost of living. It's been a hard year for startups, but even in the toughest times, some of the best ideas are born here in the UK. Bloomberg UK's Startups to Watch will profile the brightest companies under 10 years old, with the winners unveiled at the Bloomberg Technology Summit in London in October. Get your entry in by the 7th of August for the chance to have your company profiled and to attend unique networking events. Good luck, and we hope to see you there. 
for the first, you know, call it 18 years at Chipotle, this was you come into Chipotle along the line, you interact with the crew, and you customize your meal. We've got this separate make line, and it's digitized, and so the orders come in, and they're they're really kind of staged so that if you say at noon, I want to come in at 1 o'clock, we hold that order, and we will send it to the crew like maybe 10 to 1. Right. So it's ready right when you pull up your car. How do you manage these kind of two different staffing needs, right? Yes. And making sure you have the right amount of people yes. at the, at the right, right time. We spend a lot of time uh, projecting sales. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, it's part art, part science. We're trying to bring more science and more AI into it. Because yeah. if you get the right sales projection, then you know exactly what your sale, what your staffing needs to be. So if you get the sales right, you can get the entire restaurant staffed perfectly with just a couple people. Our, our average restaurant now does about um, over a million dollars per restaurant in digital sales. Was going to keep reading World Cup. This is a three. As the economic picture done. Is it the okay's getting ready to make The names that move markets are on Bloomberg. Concentration in industry after industry after industry is a threat to our economy. It is a threat to innovation and ultimately often leads to price gouging, whether it's consumers or the government. I believe in the power of markets. But they only work if we enforce the rules that keep competitors going rather than monopolists. Nobody covers business like Bloomberg, your global business authority. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. One call from Wall Street that caught our eye this morning. I should be more specific. Critty found this one, shared it with the team, so kudos go to her. It's Goldman's David Costin. He says, quote, we believe recent S&P 500 valuation expansion, despite higher rates, is reasonable considering the longer-term relationship between rates and equities, the improvement in expected growth, and the high market concentration in stocks benefiting from AI optimism. He then goes on to say, we believe risk to valuation are tilted to the upside if the multiples of laggards catch up or yields fall. Critty, I think if you had told me after 500 basis points of increases from the Fed, if we we're going to stare down more multiple increases, we we're going to stare down the pain trade being equities up, I'm going to be honest, I probably would not have believed you. Yeah, and I think it's a pretty contrarian call coming out of Goldman Sachs in particular. We know that a lot of the major Wall Street banks are still saying, look, there may be more kind of green on the screen ahead for the stock market, but when you look at valuations, they're still not really there. So David Cost is saying, well, maybe they're reasonable. That is a big deal, but notice what he says. He says it's not on the fundamentals, it's on the yield story. So more of a cross-asset take rather than, yes, the AI drive is actually sustainable. Yeah, and to be fair, we did see that big sell-off in tech last week, spooked by some of the earnings. But underneath the surface, we have been witnessing this rotation of the leadership broadening out. It's what Bank of America has called for, the fact that the equity rally can sustain itself because it's not just going to be big tech, Critty, that yeah. carries us. Yeah, I mean, this is something that tech broadly ha ha talks about, right? That it starts with the tech space, and then fundamentally as well, uh, tech also hits every part of the economy. So certainly something we're going to be watching, especially this week when we're dealing with earnings, plus some of the central banks. Ooh, it's almost like you knew where we were going next, Critty. Mm. Let's recap some of the breaking news we've gotten, because we have gotten so much, and it's only a Monday, coming from China, Critty, that the Politburo has vowed to optimize adjust property policies and that they're going to adopt a plan to resolve local government de de debt risks, is of course ahead of their Politburo meeting on Friday, where we'll get a readout on the following Monday. Yeah, it's something pretty similar to what we've been hearing. We know that China's trying to step in for their slowing economy. They're trying to boost a little bit more of that consumption. But on those headlines alone, to your point, Danny, you are seeing some moves in the dollar yuan. 719 is where we're at there. Yep, and of course, there's also the BOJ saying that there might be, according to people familiar, revising up their inflation outlook to above 2%. Still some doubts as to whether that will be sustained, so it doesn't necessarily mean a change on Friday.
venture capital. It's been volatile. From bank crisis anxiety to AI exuberance, Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow chat with the biggest names about the latest tech trends. Is AI going to dominate the earnings narrative for, for this sector this week? I think we're seeing opportunity and potential platform shift that we haven't seen in a long time. If you're a company today and you're not embracing the changes that are taking place with AI, you're going to be behind. How do you prove to the investor base that you haven't just tacked on AI to make yourself sexy? It's very hard to differentiate if you're not experienced with AI. The startup stories. We think this is a watershed moment for technology. Certain categories are more exciting than others. Right now, obviously, generative AI is a category that is very exciting to startup founders, customers, and venture capitalists as well. So what we are seeing is a new area of opportunities for new founders to come and change the industries that matter. And the real talk on realistic valuations. Some of the best opportunities are, are sitting right in front of us. How do you discern which ones are good on the marketplace right now? I think founders have woken up to the reality that taking on more money at higher terms doesn't necessarily play to their benefit in the long run. How do you actually invest? Follow the VC money on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West, only on Bloomberg Television. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, trying to open. This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. A pivotal week for central banks kicks off with euro area PMIs that point to economic malaise. The Fed and ECB are both expected to hike, while yield curve control will, of course, be in focus for the BOJ. We just got those headlines. We will dive into them throughout the rest of the show. Plus, earnings season ramps up. Alphabet, Meta, and Intel could shed more light on how AI is upending the tech industry. Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Ford, and P&G also on the agenda. We're going to get a read on the health of the consumer from those companies as well. And over in Spain, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez denies his right-wing opponents a majority in Parliament. The IBEX drops as the country faces political gridlock yet again. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Danny, you know, it was pretty clear that central banks were going to be in the focus, but just in the last 30 minutes, just double emphasizing how important they are this week. I mean, what is going on, Kriti? It is Monday. It is the Monday of a summer. I thought it was supposed to be a little bit easier. I thought everyone was on a beach somewhere, but we've had breaking headline after breaking headline. The big ones, the big market movers, really came over the past two hours with the European PMI data basically disappointing across the board. That brought the euro back in. Any strength disappeared. A lot of the bets are on the other side of things. A lot of bets right now are stacking up on dollar weakness. That's not how it's playing out today. So the euro isn't able to hold above 110. Two-year yield in the UK, that gets a bid, as does all of European debt, again, off the back of that poor reading on PMIs. Is the ECB really going to be able to be as aggressive and commit to that higher for longer narrative if we're getting data of the likes we did today. So UK two-year yield comes in nine basis points. We back off of the peak terminal rate of 5.8%, something like 5.7 now. European equities, those are able to fight any downtrend. But the thing that is disappointing, the thing that is underperforming and dragging them down is the IBEX, the Iberian Peninsula, down about seven-tenths of 1%. Critty, you mentioned it, off the back of Spanish elections, no clear outcome. And JP Morgan had been saying before the results that no outcome outcome would be the worst case scenario for equities. So there you have it, the one source spot in this European session, Critty. Yeah, I would say that green on screen you're seeing translating a little bit to the U.S. session, though. Of course, the Spanish index excluded. The futures higher by about two-tenths of one percent. We're looking at 45.75 on the index there. A little bit of tech outperformance already in play in the pre-market session. But look, it is all about the bond and FX market in these last 30 minutes. The 10-year yield, 381, we'll call it down about two basis points in the pre-market session. That initial move came on off of the PMIs that you got over in Europe. So you did see a little bit of a read through into the U.S. market. Now, as you see that move, you would think that the dollar would weaken. And it really hasn't until you saw new headlines coming from, out from the BOJ and the Politburo over in China.
China as well. I want to show you the Chinese reaction in particular because the dollar yuan about 30 minutes ago was trading about 721, essentially this idea that you were going to see continued weakness in China. So that was significant. It has since paired that move to below that key 7.2 level, 719 there, uh, stronger to the greenback by about one-tenth of one percent. Of course, we're going to dive into those headlines in just a few moments. At the same time, getting headlines from the BOJ, really revisiting some of their inflation forecasts. But if you broaden it out, is it really going to be that big of a change long term? We're going to dive into that as well, moving the markets all together, specifically when it comes to commodity space. The Bloomberg Commodity Index originally moving higher off the agricultural moves. Now you have gold, copper, oil, all higher simply because of those Chinese headlines. The Bloomberg Commodity Index higher by nine-tenths of one percent. Danny. What an exciting day to be a macro trader, Kriti, with all those headlines you were commenting on and the European economic story. I want to show you this chart. Kriti brought it up earlier, but it's so good we had to do it again. For a radio listening audience, we're looking at PMIs, manufacturing PMIs across Europe. They've all been falling really steadily. If you notice one line on top, it is the U.S. One line on the bottom, the blue line, it's Germany. Manufacturing in Germany came in at 38.8. The estimate was for 41. This is the first time Germany PMIs for manufacturing have come in below 40 since COVID, that have come in below 40 since the great financial crisis. This was some ugly data. Joining us now is Rafaela Tenconi, founder and chief economist at ADA Economics. Rafaela, just starting pure and simple with the data, how ugly is it for Europe? Good morning. Good morning. It's not that ugly as it mm. looks. It's a continuation of what we've seen since March and April. Manufacturing sector began to stutter there. Uh, when you look at slightly different survey data, you will see that order book is still very high. Financial stress on companies is still very small. The biggest bottleneck is still labor shortage, actually. So the good side for the economy is that it's bringing lower inflation pressures. So I think what you're looking at is just growth slightly above zero, but under 1%. It's not a recession. Mm. It's likely to continue another two, maybe three quarters, with the beginning of 2024 being really the pivot time on the upside, I think. Rafael, this is making me feel better, because I was ready to go all doom and gloom, and you've put me in my place here. <laughs> um, okay, does that mean anything different for the ECB then? Can they continue to hike? Can they continue to go lower, higher for longer? If it is, okay, the trend is not great, but it's not awful. So my personal opinion is that in reality, the ECB should have probably stopped hiking a while ago. So monetary conditions are already a bit too tight. But in reality, the central bank and the council is very anxious about inflation, and therefore they will hike this month, probably hike again in September. And maybe you need to wait until the end of the year before they really comfortably signal a pause. We think the direction for rates is still for a cut next year of 100 basis points. So your, your long-term new level is 350. Um, but in the near term, it's true. Eurozone inflation is still about 3% next year. Rafael, the, the Eurozone story is so interesting because uh, one of the dynamics we've really seen in this kind of last two or three years post-COVID has been this divergence in monetary policy with all of the major central banks around the world. I think the ECB is the best poster child of that right now. But on the other end of the spectrum sits the BOJ. Now, I know uh, you don't necessarily focus on the BOJ, but I want to run these headlines by you. In the last 30 minutes or so, we got news that they're set to mull a big increase in the 2023 inflation outlook. That is a big deal coming from Japan, which has kind of been stuck in in this deflationary cycle for decades, I, I would argue. Does that have any meaningful read-through into kind of the way the Federal Reserve, the ECB, or arguably the BOE thinks? So first of all, I would say Japan is just lagging everyone, but is experiencing the same thing as every other country. There is a tightness of labor that is persistent. There is a structural pro-inflationary trend. Uh, and there's just a cycle right now that is keeping inflation in the Eurozone and in the U.S. On, on a downward trend. So I think eventually the BOJ has to really tighten monetary policy, but because they're behind everybody else, it's probably a 2024 story more than this year. And in terms of read-through, what I would say is the key risk is that the ECB and the Fed over-tighten if they really keep rates high next year, especially because you have 
the Japanese central bank, the BOV, and the Swiss central bank all still on a tightening base. So the global monetary conditions will be very tight by then. You know, Raphael, it's interesting you say it's a 2024 story. Only a couple months away, I might add, since saying that we're almost close to uh, August and, and, and September, excuse me, five months away. What's important to keep in mind, though, is the talking about whether or not inflation is going to be, dare I say it, transitory or not. And, and it took a very long time for the Federal Reserve to get on board. But here's the BOJ saying the exact same thing. They're saying they have doubts that this upward price momentum will persist. Raphael, talk to us about the stickiness of this inflation. We're talking about it coming down, but what are the odds it sticks around or perhaps ticks higher around the world? So inflation is highly cyclical and very influenced by food and energy. So right now in Europe and in the US, it is on a downward trend. It will still be low next year. Uh, but if the, the, the inertia you will see it in 2025, where in my view, it's practically impossible, for example, that Eurozone inflation will be at 2% in 2025, it will definitely be 3% of higher. Because by then, the, the cycle will have turned, you will have more consumption back, you will still have the tight labor market, and you will have the digitalization inflationary effect that will reveal itself again. So we are in an inflationary decade. There is no escaping that. Well, one of the really fascinating things about your work, uh, Rafaela, is how income, income inequality plays in to the monetary outlook. How, how does it change the game for central bankers if we have a wider divide between the haves and the have-nots? So there are two near-term aspects. The first one, the U.S. has better data than the EU, uh, but the U.S. can tell you that already the top 20% of the income distribution has more cash at hand than the bottom 80%. Um, and their demand is more inelastic. So especially because now we have more machine learning driving pricing strategies, it makes services inflation, for example, a lot stickier. Okay, it doesn't erase the cycle, mm. but it affects the inertia and the trajectory. So there is, first of all, a, a problem there. The second issue is that when the income distribution becomes so polarized, it practically, the mean doesn't represent anything. You need to look at the two sides and then adjust both sides. So for central bank, it means rethinking how they do policy. And for 2024, the issue is everybody votes. Yes. So the top, bottom, <laughs> yeah. is going to express this malaise. And so this is, this is really why we don't believe that higher for longer is really credible in 2024, because you will have inflation that is lower, you will have the economy sub-potential, and you will have elections. Central banks have a practical independence and institutional independence, but they live within society. Of course. So I think that is important for that, them. That is so fascinating, because also you can't have one central bank policy for the top 20% and a different policy for others. So if transmission then is changed because of that, does it mean already that they've done too much at this point of what we're witnessing, again, is the inelastic nature of the top earners, of, of the top income quartile. Well, they've done too much for a vast majority in the number, but they've not done enough in the wealth holding. So th this, is the, this is the practical issue. Mm -hmm. I think it improves significantly if you can provide more transparency on what is going on and if you can provide more guidance. So that's why we say 350 is probably the best policy rate that strikes a balance, especially with all of these transitions that you're going mm. doing. You know, I mean, energy transition, green transition, digital transition, really complicated. You know, the private sector, yeah. top and bottom needs to handle it. And if you yeah. have a central bank that just like hides like that, it's not helping. <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> it's certainly something we're going to be keeping our eye on. Raffaella Tanconi, ahead of a crucial Central Banks Week over of ADA Economics. We thank you, as always, for joining the program. So you've got central banks on the agenda. You also have that major earning story, specifically in some of the big tech names, also dealing with antitrust issues. We're going to speak to Andrea Cacelli, the former UK Competition and Markets Authority CEO, next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.
London will stay a financial center. It will stay our MIA hub. We'll just have a rebalancing onto the continent. And actually, the numbers of who has moved across aren't that big. So it's sort of in the 200 level. And if you think about 15,000 people, that's sort of not that material. Um, and so I do think both will basically continue to grow and continue to be very relevant. What will change, though, and the big thing that's changing, is actually the risk-taking is what's going to move. And so we've historically had risk-taking in the UK. That risk-taking and the assets that go with it, not the people alone, but the assets that go with it, that's the next phase of what we're now moving into. And that will be a material change. that move markets are on Bloomberg. China has seen slower growth than they expected. Many countries do depend on strong Chinese growth to promote growth in their own economies. For the United States, growth is slowed, but our labor market continues to be quite strong. I don't expect a recession. I think we're in a good path. Nobody covers business like Bloomberg, your global business authority. I don't think it's the case that there's a particular approach on Microsoft and, and a different approach on other deals. Uh, there are many, many transactions where uh, we take a, a very similar approach to the, the EC and to the US. And indeed, of course, it's important to remember that we had very much the same concerns about the impact of the transaction as the European Commission did. Sarah Cardell there, the current chief executive of the UK's Competition and Markets Authority, speaking with us last Friday on essentially the hurdles towards passing this Microsoft Activision deal in the UK. Joining us now is Andrea Cascelli, her predecessor, the former CEO of the UK CMA. He's now a partner and head of Europe over at Keystone. Of course, they re represent the firm, um, uh, represent Microsoft in the Activision takeover with the UK. So, uh, Andrea, a lot to digest in that deal space. Of course, we know you can't comment on that specifically, just given your conflict of interest. Well, let's talk about it broadly. One of the criticisms that the UK is dealing with right now is that when it comes to deal making, they are often the odd man out relative to their peers in the US and Europe. How long do you think that can sustain? How successful can the CMA be if they are the holdout in the regulatory scrutiny of the world? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it is true to characterize the CMA as being substantially in a different place from other agencies. I mean, I think the vast majority of deals, uh, the CMA ends up in the same place as the EC and the U.S. agencies. Uh, and generally, I would say the U.S. agencies and the CMA have been in a very similar place uh, in a lot of the recent deals. Now, uh, obviously, there have been uh, instances like the Microsoft case now where the courts in the U.S. have uh, ended up in a different place, but that's not where the agencies are. And also, I think if you look at the draft merger guidelines that the U.S. agencies uh, published last week, again, there, there is a lot of similarity with some of the positions the CMA have taken over time and the CMA merger guidelines in 2021. Well, talk to us then about kind of the way it differs from the European Commission in, in particular. We know, for example, if you look at the deal uh, kind of book from the last uh, couple of years, Broadcom VMware, Amazon iRobot, Adobe Figma, these are deals and approaches that the European Commission and the CMA have actually diverged on. Andrea, talk to us about the legal mindset here. Why is there that divergence in thinking? Yeah, again, I think... You know, these are some examples. There have been a number of other cases where the EC and the CMA have been in the same place. I think one of the key differences is the approach to, to remedies. So there have been some instances where the European Commission and the CMA have both concluded that there were problems with particular transactions, and the CMA has found it harder to accept some of the remedies proposed by the parties. So that has been the example with Microsoft Activision. And there was a similar example uh, last year with cargo tech corn cranes. On the other hand, there have been cases like uh, Broadcom VMware uh, or Amazon iRobot, where essentially the CMA has cleared the transactions in a situ or provisionally cleared, like in the case of Broadcom, in situations where uh, the European Commission has found problems and, uh, and either is still investigating or, in the case of Broadcom, has accepted some remedies. 
And, you know, when, when we spoke um, to the CMA, Critty and I, on, on Friday, she was very clear in saying that, look, you know, we're, we're separate from politics. But there has been criticism, Jeremy Hunt among them, saying that the CMA needs to understand its role in, in promoting economic growth. Andrea, what would that actually look like if the CMA were to adjust policies for that? Is there even a way to do that? Well, I mean, the CMA, he's trying to promote economic growth. So in many ways, I think the CMA would disagree with some of these statements. I mean, the, you know, markets where there are monopolies or where there are significant market powers are not markets where you get economic growth. And more generally, there are lots of factors affecting economic growth, and merger control is only one of those. So I think this has been an instance where, um, you know, some of the political interventions have focused on some of the broad political pieces post-Brexit in the economy, and I think merger control is really only a small part of it. Another thing, uh, uh, again, um, you know, and, and you know this obviously very well with your time at the CMA, is just if you look at, again, I know you can't comment on the deal specifically, and, and you're among them, the firepower behind Microsoft, the, the amazing staff there on lawyers, and CMA, I mean, it, it is a small staff. You know, if I can take you back to those days, what does it mean to be trying to handle this immense caseload, this global caseload, again, when resources are kind of limited? Yeah, so that's, that's clearly an, an issue for, for every agency, for the CMA among them. I mean, I think the, the complexity in some of these cases has now reached the stage where it is quite hard for the agencies. I mean, obviously, the agencies are, you know, properly staffed and, and, and really focused on, on, on the priority cases, but clearly there is an imbalance of resources. Uh, and in many ways, I think it's quite interesting, again, uh, going back to the draft merger guidelines last week, the U.S. agencies are essentially trying to bring in some presumptions, and that really has to do with priorities and, and resources, because essentially, I think what the agencies are saying is, you know, there are some deals that are obviously problematic, and we should be able to challenge them without spending, you know, 15, 16 months looking at it with very large teams. That's the only way we can then devote those type of resources to more complicated deals like, let's say, Microsoft Activision. Um, and so I think that's, that's clearly a very important element for, for merger control. Yeah. Well, Andrea, let's dive into then another one of the major deals, that $20 billion deal from Adobe and Figma, two companies that have already worked so closely together. One of the criticisms, specifically from the CMA, is that this is a perfect example of vertical integration that would threaten that innovation, that economic growth that you were just talking about. Your take on the Adobe Figma deal, what is a potential remedy for, for the CMA? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the deal with that's all the kind of hallmarks of what agencies worry about at the moment. So it's an acquisition for a very large amount of money, a very large multiple, and uh, at a valuation that is significantly higher than the most recent private valuation before the acquisition. So it is unsurprising that there is a very detailed scrutiny of this transaction. It's now at phase two uh, in the UK. Uh, it's currently being investigated by the EC and, and the DOJ is looking at it. So, you know, it, it's difficult to comment from the outside. I mean, it's clearly a complex deal and clearly there is a lot of work going on by the agencies. Whether there are possible remedies, if the agencies find a problem, I, I don't know. It's difficult to speculate from the outside. But again, the position of the U.S. agencies and the CMA is that they, they don't really like this type of behavioral remedies in complex sort of dynamic deals like this one. So I don't think that has changed. Uh, at the same time, obviously, the agencies uh, adjust their risk appetite as uh, cases, um, you know, play out in the courts. And so I think Adobe Figma is a very important data point for anyone who looks at global merger control in terms of, you know, what's going to happen in the coming months. Yeah, and perhaps setting the tone for some of the other tech deals that are on uh, both the CMA and the European Commission's docket. Andrea Cacelli, uh, a partner at Keystone, of course, a former CEO of the CMA. We thank you, as always, for joining the program. Coming up, a look at some of the market-moving events to watch throughout this week. We go macro, we go micro. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.
Steve's ability on the course may not be etched into any record books, but no, following him around, no, it's no, clear no, that it's not for away. lack of trying. Jeez. We were constantly hustling behind him as he caught up with executives in the portfolio companies and reminisced with former and current players. He was a day trader. He bought himself, self, self-made day trader. Yeah. And so he's on the bus after a game in New England, and he's day trading on the bus, and Bill Belichick sees him and cuts him on the spot. You know, in many ways, it's a convention, right, of the people that I don't see maybe once a year. And so it's kind of all come together. My firm, our charity, our fundraising efforts, and then the friends that are around. My dad and my brother, it all happens right there as a confluence of all these parts of my life that have found its common center. ask me all the time, what is the key to being a really good investor? And I tell them it's to surround yourself with and work with the best investors you can find. On Bloomberg Wealth, I'm going to take you to meet the greatest investors in the world, the people that I would like to have managing my money. It's a hurricane over real estate right now. We're in the Category 5 hurricane, and it's sort of a black cloud hovering over the entire industry until we get some relief or some understanding of what the Fed's going to do. What is ahead on this very busy week? We're going to get U.S. PMIs, 9.45 a.m. Eastern Time today. Then big tech earnings, Alphabet and Microsoft report on Tuesday. Then three rate decisions in three days. Fed on Wednesday, ECB and on Thursday. And then rounding out the week, Critty, BOJ on Friday. A lot to digest. Of course, you mentioned those tech earnings. Let's go from the macro to the micro because already you're seeing some movement in the media space. Of course, coming off of the heels of Barbie and Oppenheimer's big kind of weekend debut. Uh, we talked about this last week about what order we would go see it in. We'll leave that conversation for off the air. But right now, you are seeing a big move right now in likes of AMC Entertainment, higher by 60%. Remember, some of that has to do with the court ruling over the weekend from their Ape shares as well, taking a hit. Warner Brothers Discovery and Mattel also higher by 1% this morning, Danny. Yeah, look, I'm going to be honest. I didn't do it, Critty. I said I would. I didn't see Barbie <laughs> or Oppenheimer. So I'm going to leave here and make up for my sins. Maybe try to sneak out to the movie theater. All right, that's it for us. Surveillance is up ahead. This is Bloomberg. whose values we don't share. To the world of business. It's all about corporate power in the end. Balance of Power, live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. We well, couldn't be more excited at what's in store for you. How long will it take? How many years? Why don't we take this one day at a time? Good luck. Everybody has a perspective. Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, join host Anne-Marie Hordern. It's the one area, really, of bipartisanship. Well, I think we're getting more of it. That's an optimistic. And Joe Matthew. The debt ceiling is looming. How close are we going to get to the line before you start to worry? Alongside Kaylee Lyons. The door was open for regulators to do more. And that puts the Fed between a rock and a hard place. As they deliver news. This is such an important economic issue. He's no longer trying to run away from that it. That really a blue
lose some lives. Insight. We can both invest in law enforcement and also make sure that communities feel safe in their own skin. And analysis. I think your audience will get this more than most. This is not the Republican Party that you know. It allows him to do what he did so successfully in 2020, which is run against crazy. From and about politics' biggest power players. This was the zombie case. And it's now more than well alive. That's for sure. Uh, with two more potentially to come. I'm willing to have this battle. It is vitally important. This is the intersection of Washington and Wall Street. Bringing people directly to the decision makers right. that impact your investments and your life. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Markets come down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. Of course, the equity market's really been largely driven by uh, the tech stocks. The dispersion across all yield curves would be telling you that the recession should be starting. I think it's a little bit of a, of a warning of some of the toppy things becoming less toppy. We are restrictive. We're not super restrictive. The echoes and the ramifications of the Fed's action, uh, some of that remains to be seen. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. What a week coming up, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 positive by 0.2%. Coming up this week, a Federal Reserve decision, the ECB, the BOJ, and TK, about 40% of the S&P 500 and market cap reporting earnings. Good news and bad news from those companies on earnings. I agree the central bank story leads away. I'm going to call it, as John just mentioned, Fed to ECB to Bank of Japan. Pan week. Uh, but the earnings story is great. I love what Ryan Bean writes up on the disaster known as Minnesota manufacturing and mining. For every Apple, for every Microsoft, Apple out the next week, but for, for all the techs that are reporting and all that, there are these companies that are struggling and they need to reset in this pandemic. Recovery. 3M, a little bit later this week. Let's talk about the data out of Europe as well. Can we get a reset there? Going into the ECB, <clears throat> never mind the Federal Reserve, we talk about the Fed hiking into strength in America and the yeah. labor market. Check out Europe. 42 on a manufacturing PMI in the Eurozone, 51 on services, the composite sub-50. I'll make that simple. That's contractionary territory, Tom. That's a problem. Zoe Schneeweiss in Zurich reports on this with a great chart here on this rollover, and I really can't say enough about this. For those trying to stay in touch and tune with Wall Street, uh, in the middle of the summer, it's the combination of those PMIs, John, uh, the blended PMIs. You're better at this than I am, but on France... And on Germany, the idea of significantly sub-50 PMIs, that to me is the lead story today. Dear China, can we have a bailout? Can we get some stimulus <coughs> and get that stimulus fast? The Politburo yeah. over in China, the top decision-making body led by President Xi, with this this morning, vowing to strengthen domestic consumption. Do yeah. you think that's strong enough? I think it's odd from five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Their playbook, the key question for me is we talk to Chinese experts is there something new here? I don't think there's anything new here. This is the model a totalitarian regime has in Beijing. So the topic they all want us to talk about, TK, did you watch any of those movies over the weekend? <coughs> Barbie, Oppenheimer? No. Big one? You know, come on. I, I'm going to watch Top Gun before I see Barbie. I think you know um, the number. I, yeah, I did okay on yeah, that. Yeah, 155 yeah, you know, for Barbie over the weekend in U.S. and Canadian theaters. One of the offspring saw it. She, she said it was nice, but she wasn't in love with Barbie. You know, I mean, she said it was sort of a statement, not a movie. I don't know. Oppenheimer, Emmanuel Derman, the great quant, uh, he went, he took his Ph.D. at Columbia under, under one of Oppenheimer's direct disciples. He was not thrilled with Oppenheimer, but a lot of people were. And I, I want to know, do people see it a second, a third, a fourth time? We used to do that, John. They may well do. What a fantastic <coughs> opening weekend for the movie business here in America over the weekend. We'll get to the numbers in about 30 minutes from now. Let's turn to the price action in the equity market on the S&P 500, going into a major week for central banking decisions and earnings too. Equity futures up by 0.2% on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields just a little bit lower by a couple of basis points off the back of that downside surprise in Europe and beyond. Yields right now, 381. We're down two basis points there. And there's the euro weakness, T. 
PK. The euro <laughs> against the dollar at one point in the last week, having a look at 113. Yeah. We're down for another day on euro dollar. We're well, negative four tenths of 1%. Moments ago, euro Swissy goes through 0.96. To me, this is the key metric out there right now is the idea of Switzerland ascendant. And you see it best looking at Jason's term euro as compared to Swiss, 0.95. 968. I know it's a meaningless number to most people, but the sum total of what I'm watching is what you and I watched when I first met Pharaoh. I first met Pharaoh and he was like Michael Schumacher's. Just, I think I think you actually forget that, when we first can't. met, but yeah. Got that right. Yeah. I, I said that about the third wife. It was, it was well. a special time. It was, yes. It was. Let me go through the calendar for a special week. A special Wednesday, week. the Federal Reserve, the ECB on Thursday, on Friday, the BOJ, and allow me to go through the earnings week as well. Alphabet, Google, that's coming on Tuesday, Tom. <coughs> Meta on Wednesday. You're going to hear from Amazon on Thursday. Microsoft coming on Tuesday as well. Yeah. Then into next week, so next Thursday, is when we hear from the Bank of England and Apple. we got to get to Ben, but to me, the big thing there is Amazon to see how this broad three business is doing the cloud, the cardboard boxes, that to me is the most interesting. Let's get to Ben later right now, sure. the global market strategist at eToro. Ben, you've heard the complaints, narrow leadership, tech dominance going into tech earnings. Do we need to worry about that? It, it's certainly a big week. I think we're going we're gonna to get a lot of clarity this week. I think you know, the Fed and the ECB, you know, peaking, giving a bit of visibility. There's not very much further to go, if anything. I think we'll keep valuations high. And to your point, we have, you know, north of 40% of the S&P 500 <coughs> reporting this week. I think the baton is now passing from valuations, where you've made all your money this year, to earnings. We're in a bit of a no man's land, but this will be the trough for S&P 500 earnings. And I think there's going to be enough of sort of a glimmer of growth coming out of tech to um, give us enough momentum to get us through uh, the summer and, to, frankly, keep this sort of pain trade, uh, pain trade going. <coughs> You know, Ben, I love the single sentence in your research report. You go right to the heart of the seven stocks, and I want to focus folks on the idea that Ben Laidler's nailed this for three solid years. You talk about a huge, a high-margin tech sector. I mean, it's just as simple as that. The retail public agrees. The institutions are far more cautious, according to the reports we see from Bloomberg Markets. Who's right? The institutions are a retail in love with Apple. Yeah, so, so retail, you know, never really gave up on this market, whether it's tech, whether it's crypto, you know, they, they sort of stuck with it. And I think, you know, I think this is a fundamentally <laughs> driven market, you know, top of the Fed cycle, inflation coming down, interest rate cuts on the horizon, earnings cycle are sort of about to turn up. But there's a big technical overlay to this, which, you know, is your point that the more this market grinds higher, the more these institutional managers, you know, they can moan as much as they like, but ultimately you get paid to manage money. And we are, what, seven months into this rally here, and I think the fundamentals are increasingly validating it. I think, you know, any pullback you get will be small because this money will have to step up. The, the, this is the key point, Ben. You know, you're, you're expert at this. You nailed this. I believe it was Christmas of 2018. I really can't remember right now, Ben. But the answer is it's July when does that pressure click in on 12-month end-of-December performance? Does it happen now, or does it happen after American Labor Day? Well, so logic tells you it happens after, after Labor Day, and we have that sort of typical sort of Santa rally, fourth quarter rally. You know, that's your strongest quarter of the year as we all look ahead to, to next year, which I think is going to be a fantastic year, um, you know, and, and we start to discount some of that. But of course, you know, if, if me and a few others are out here saying this, you know, maybe it comes early. Um, I do think we're due a breather, given the massive rally we've had, given, you know, summer seasonality, given the VIX at 13. But, you know, I've been proved wrong. The market right now wants to go a step further and rotate into these cheaper cyclicals. We've just had 10 days of down rallying. I think that's a bit early, but it does tell you, you know, what the market's thinking. The market's looking for the next, um, you know, for the next rotation, for the next sort of leg up, and it thinks it's going to come from the growth sensitives. Ben, you sounded you know? so confident then. Next year's going to be a fantastic year. What's behind that conviction? I, I think we're going to be looking ahead to a re-acceleration of earnings. So right now, earnings this quarter will be down 6 7 8%. I think the earnings season in January... That'll be our first quarter of double-digit earnings, uh, and I think we're going to continue uh, for the year. And, that, and the drivers of that, which we'll start to see this quarter, will be the relief to profit margins 
We talk a lot about the revenue recession. We don't talk enough about the relief coming through from profit margins. And the Fed will be cutting interest rates. We'll be very close to the Fed cutting interest rates. And I think that will help keep uh, valuations you know, high. And, and then just sort of finally, stock markets are not economies, right? This is a very long duration stock market. It's full of tech. It's full of healthcare. It's full of these sort of high multiple um, you know, sectors, which I think are very sensitive uh, to, uh, to, to bond yields and, and, and the Fed cutting rates. Let's just unpack some of that. Why would the Fed be cutting rates? Because inflation is coming down more quickly than anticipated or because growth is fading? Well, a little bit of both, right? So we've got, you know, headline inflation of 3%, yeah, core sticky. But I think that what we're going to see over the next, you know, three months, or we have, we have two, um, you know, we have two more inflation prints before, before the Fed meeting after this. I think you're going to see those uh, numbers, uh, those headline numbers, you know, uh, begin to sort of come down further. But I do think, and this is why I'm sort of leaning against this sort of market rotation in cyclicals, I still think, you know, most of that growth slowdown is still to come. Um, I don't think it's going to be a recession, but I think it's inevitable we see some sort of slowdown. I think, you know, you highlighted what we're seeing in Europe. I think that is the sort of canary in the coal mine of the slowdown which is coming. I don't think that's necessarily too much to fear for the, at the market level, um, but it is enough to sort of keep you in these sort of defensive uh, growth names like tech and healthcare and away from these sort of value trans cyclicals, you know, commodities and small cap. And ben, what you mentioned, though, brings up the logical follow-up question, which is how does earnings growth reaccelerate if we are seeing disinflation and slower economic growth? Where does that come from? Yeah, I, I think that's the story for the next sort of six months. But I think once we get through um, into, you know, beginning of next year, I think things begin to sort of firm up a little bit. You know, we're going to get a bit more stimulus, you know, out of China. Uh, we'll, we'll, see how, we'll, we'll see how strongly it is. And, and I do think the U.S. consumer remains a sort of real, you know, real anchor here. I think the labor market will, you know, soften up a little bit. Um, but you know, we're still sitting on, um, you know, I think that lower inflation will give right. purchasing power back to consumers and also some, some power back to uh, corporate right. margins. Ben, you have lived the strategist wars. And I say this with immense respect, folks, for Mr. Laidler's magnificent call and lonely call at the end of 2018. What's the pressure at the major houses, the major banks right now, on people slotted in and convince their bears? So it's, so it's tough, right? Valuations are high and earnings are going to be down, you know, 7 8% this quarter, right? So um, it doesn't look that bullish, but markets are very forward-looking. And I think, you know, we're looking to the Fed cutting interest rates. We're looking to the start of that next growth cycle. We're going to get, I think, a glimmer of hope on earnings, you know, this quarter uh, from, the, from these tech giants. And again, Stock market's not economy. This is very long duration. This is very tech heavy. It's really the opposite of what we're seeing a lot of the stock market. And on top of that, you know, it's it, a lot of people have sort of missed the rally, right? And, and it's and it's difficult to sort of, um, you know, unless the facts in their mind dramatically change, which they haven't. But I think, you know, people will get gradually dragged into this rally because they have to. Because I do think the fundamentals, and we trade on the incremental data point, I think the fundamentals are going to incrementally maybe get a little bit less worse and then turn, you know, absolutely positive maybe maybe at the beginning of the year, beginning of next year. Interesting. Confident, optimistic, constructive call from Ben Laidler of eToro on this equity market. Got into a massive week. Let's be clear about that from tech and central bank decisions alike. Ben, thank you, sir. Ben Lader there of eToro. Central bank decisions worth repeating. The Federal Reserve on Wednesday, ECB on Thursday, BOJ on Friday. Talked a lot about the ECB coming up on Thursday, Tom. Hiking into some real weakness potentially in yeah, the Eurozone economy. I, I take your point, and, and I'm going to lean on you on this because you do it better than me, but ECB to me is way more interesting than the Fed uh, here. I would also point out, and this has been underplayed, I thought Anne-Marie Horton did a great job last week, Ukraine is not a small matter. There is a war going on in Ukraine. And to the credit of Bloomberg and the other news organizations, they're keeping it front and center, but I don't see it visibly in the minds of investors or, or the American public in general. And it's out there. And I'm sorry, it is an overlaid for Lagarde at that press conference. The Kona hat coming up in about 40 minutes' time, 30 minutes' time on this program. <clears throat> we need to talk about what's happening with wheat over the last couple of weeks and how yeah. concerned certain nations should be about their ability to import it from that area of the world. Yeah, and, and, and for those that need a primer on this, it's about Mediterranean dynamics coming out of the Black Sea into the Levant, into the Eastern Mediterranean, and then what? And there's a huge mystery to it right now. Even overnight, there was 
uh, not battles, but, you know, there was unrest towards the Black Sea. How much sport did you watch this weekend? I watched. I, I just, John, I can't thank you enough. I, I, folks, I could care less about F1, and John got and me into this. And now you adore it. And, you know, and and I, I enjoyed it immensely. And my one, I beg, I beg the American networks, just let Sky Sports do it. <laughs> the British announcers are so much better. They're like looking at the pit stop, 1.9 seconds fast, for Perez, eh? fastest ever. If the Americans Not are doing this, if the Americans are doing season, this, it would be, oh, Daniel Ricardo's sister's watching in Perth. <laughs> Not weighing in on that. Dougie Chowdhury of BlackRock in the next hour on the equity market. Big week coming up. David Rubenstein show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations. I uncover the untold stories of the world's most successful leaders. Watch Wednesdays on Bloomberg Television. Welcome to the world of decentralized finance. You can see the massive gains for the OG crypto coin. The breakout we have all perhaps long awaited finally realized. We'll see if it sticks. Bloomberg's covering all things crypto, the people. There's no question this industry is composed of some bad actors and some good actors. The transactions. Volumes have surpassed $24 billion per day. And the technology. Stop talking about the technology. Start demonstrating the utility. Bloomberg Crypto, Tuesdays. Wednesday, the market expects another rate hike. They're getting the message loud and clear. The Fed <clears throat> wants to go again. The then what is the big mystery. But will it be the last of the cycle? Is it one and done or more to come? Does the Fed make policy based on what they're worried about or what they actually see? Trust Bloomberg for the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis. Twice more is not too high of a bar. The Fed wants all options on the table. Bloomberg surveillance. The Fed decides. Wednesday on Bloomberg. Your global business authority. three are going to hike by 25 basis points, but that's where the commonality will end. I think the Fed will come across as dovish, the Bank of England will still be quite hawkish, and the ECB will be in the middle in terms of their forward policy guidance. That was Mohammed al Erin on some of the central bank decisions still to come over the next couple of weeks. A triple header this week with the Federal Reserve, ECB and BOJ just around the corner. To kick things off this morning, equities firmer by 0.2% on the S&P 500. On the S&P, around about 40% of the market cap of this S&P 500 reporting earnings this week alone. It's that monster <coughs> week of earnings season. It comes this week. In the bond market, yields a little bit lower by three basis points. Your 10-year, 380. 55 on a U.S. 10-year. Just downside surprise on the data in Europe. Downside surprise on the data in the U.K. And a little bit of economic data coming later in the United States. The PMIs in the 9 o'clock Eastern hour, Tom, a little bit later this morning. Well, the data coming in, and of course the data here, we stagger around to jobs uh, a day in August. I think that's important. But I'm sorry, John, the whole thing is about the inflation report whenever it is, August 10th, whenever. I mean, I think I'm like, that's the next big report, I would suggest. Can we see more disinflation going into yeah, Jackson Hole? And ultimately, it was never yeah. about the decision this week either, Tom, from the Federal Reserve. It was about the decision yeah. 
in September and beyond. I said Friday, we're really on to Jackson Hole, and that's how it feels on a Monday morning uh, in late July. It feels like a Monday morning in late July for Greg Vallier, Chief U.S. Policy Strategist at AGF Investments. We're going to heat it up right now with a strike. In the old days, and Greg and I remember them, it was about a union America, not like Europe, but tilting in that direction. And I know that's changed, but it hasn't. And it is centered around Big Brown at UPS. Greg Villiers, what I find fascinating here is all the stereotypes of our youth that Biden of Scranton, Biden of Delaware, Biden of the AFL-CIO is supposed to be wicked pro-union. Is this president wicked pro-union? He is. However, the union leaders want him to butt out. They don't want to get him involved in the talks. The head of the uh, Teamsters, very, very radical talking guy named O'Brien, has said, we don't want you involved. We don't want you invoking Taft-Hartley to bring workers back. So this week, I know the Fed is a big, big story this week, Tom. But I think this week is also a big story for the contract. Uh, they're going to come back on Tuesday. Even if they agreed on a deal on Wednesday, it would take at least a week. That's past July 1, the strike deadline, to get a deal done. So I think at the least, we're going to have a brief strike, and that's the best scenario. How does UPS expand if we are non-union America? Well, it's a good question. And, and the union wants to bring in part-time workers. They want a huge increase. And you've got copycats now. You've got the United Auto Workers indicating they may go on strike. You've got strikes in Southern California in the entertainment industry. So all of a sudden, labor militants is an issue. A big deal for Joe Biden. And I would argue a big deal for the Fed. Uh, could this preclude the Fed from another move after this week's hike? Not out of the question. They may have to wait if there's a huge strike of 340,000 workers at UPS. Greg, are you under the impression that this White House, this president, would stay out of those negotiations once that happened? Yeah, if, if, if at least for a while. He, he didn't stay out uh, earlier in the year on, I think it was railroads, but I think that he would stay out if the union says to butt out. But as we get into the fall, if this strike drags on and people talk about a supply chain issue ahead of the holidays, he's going to be under a lot of pressure to call him back to work. He's under pressure this morning. It's the problem that won't go away, Greg. It's the business dealings of his son and the alleged yep. involvement of the now president and former vice president, Joe Biden. Greg, what's your read on that story from the New York Post this morning? Yeah, I don't know. I always believe what I see in the New York Post, but it's quite a story talking about how they would bring in Joe Biden in, in phone conversations to, to close a deal. Uh, one of the participants in these conversations will be testifying before Congress this week. I don't think he's going to get impeached over it. Certainly, the Senate would never convict. But I think this is a gift to Donald Trump, because Donald Trump can say that I'm being persecuted aggressively, and Joe Biden is not. Former President Donald Trump got another gift over the weekend at a Fox Business poll. Greg, let's talk about that poll. South Carolina, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, dropping down to third place. Now, obviously, we understand Nikki Haley's roots there in South Carolina, likewise with Tim Scott. But, Greg, I'm just wondering, how bad are things for the governor of Florida and his campaign over the weekend? He's still in free fall. He's trying to break the fall. But his comment over the weekend about slavery... Uh, didn't help him. It, it uh, was quite uh, shocking, in my opinion. So DeSantis is in real trouble. I think the big issue, John, is who starts to become the number two. Could Pence make a comeback? What about Tim Scott of South Carolina? He's raised money. He's an attractive candidate. He could become the sleeper over the next few months. I mean, the debate's upon us. That's all there is to it. What's after yep. this debate? I, I mean, is it just, are you looking at it as a continuum of debates to a primary vote, or is it a new politics, Greg Vellier? Good, good question, Tom. I think there'll be a lot of fundraising. That'll be a focus on that, obviously. But I think as we get well into the fall, there'll be a lot of speculation. Could there be another candidate who could announce late this year? Interesting. I say yes. Right. I, I think it's, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think the governor of, of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, right. is still a real possibility. Bramo emails in. She's in Norway, folks, somewhere up near Greenland right now. And she emails in and says, Tom, you've got to go with it. Greg, here we go. I see all these candidates out on X. And they're out on X looking for fundraising. 
Is there yep. is there a value to fundraising through X? How did I do there? Was that okay? <laughs> Now, what do you mean, X? I Twitter. Don't Overnight, Greg, while you were looking at the polls in Washington, Elon yeah. Musk was changing the name of Twitter to X. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is there value yeah. to raising funds on X? Minimal. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, John. Was that it? X. Was that that's the all we're doing on X that's, today. That's, that's the, Mandeep's coming up that's on the coverage. X. Frank Vallier. Frank Vallier, thank you. Greg, thank you for so that. So much. TK, X, what did you make of that? I, 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 I don't even know what to say about it. it. I, I, and, then, and then the CEO, no. I say the CEO in inverted commas, comes out and starts telling us about this grand plan for, for X. Do you get the feeling that the CEO actually has the... No. Authority and no. decision-making power that would traditionally come with the CEO. You, you asked the really important question, and the answer is it remains to be seen. I think a lot of people, with respect for her career at NBC and the holistic ability in raising money persistently, are cutting her major slack. But no, you got We haven't seen it yet. This felt very haphazard. <laughs> What's great about it, really it is did. Greg didn't know about it. No, which well, I think I'm is sure. Great. I'm People sure Greg's, are like, yeah, whatever. Greg's not alone. He was looking at this poll. <laughs> I think this poll is really, really important in South Carolina, Tom. Yeah. They go through the top decisions, the top issues when deciding their choice for presidential nomination. Economic issues, 51%. Do you know where social issues come out? 12%. Yeah. Now, that's a problem for the governor of Florida, who's made social issues yes. a Big, big deal. Did he go campaign. after Barbie? I don't even know. You know I'm, he's I'm got sure the he has. I haven't thing. seen any comments, but you'd expect him to team, go after Barbie. Team political <laughs> coverage with a guy from England. It's going to be great as you and I go I into the election, wait. John. We should go no, in the think, country seriously, together. Seriously, seriously, John's going to bring an incredibly constructive prism uh, to the American political experience. Is Well, I think I still see a redound in Uxbridge, wherever the hell that is. Is that on the way to Wimbledon? Or on the way to Heathrow? Are we talking about the by-elections in the UK? Yeah, they got, the, the, the mayor that. of London, the green leftist, got hammered in Uxbridge because of his green policy in London. And I believe over the weekend... They had a one-on-one -on -one with the head of the Labour Party, and they're going to amend their hey, green policy. Jokes aside, has shifted a right in Europe. You see it in Spain, in Spain. too. Green issues yeah. taking a bit of a hit. Yeah. We have to talk to Maria today. It's a good. Bit later it, in I, the I, I need to find out what it means for Real Madrid. Beat AC Milan yesterday in a friend. I missed that. Yeah, no, no, I was focused good on game. Formula One. Good game. Yeah. Coming That's up. What I said about F1. Good Ian game. Shepherdson, Budapest. Pantheon, Macroeconomics. Big week ahead, <clears throat> central bank decisions, tons of earnings and very little coverage of X right here X. on Bloomberg. <laughs>